there is some built-in resilience that we start to see from the economies. The consumer has the savings buffer. The savings buffer is coming down. I don't think we're actually deglobalizing. I think we're just globalizing more slowly. If you look at that labor force participation rate, it's still stubborn and it retreated last month. That is an issue because that suggests a bit more permanence. This looks like a cycle that the Fed let get out of control. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from the nation's capital for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures just about positive on the S&P. TK America decides. It's a midterm election. They're different than a presidential election. But the question is, is this one the same or different than four years ago, 2018? I think that the key word here going into tonight's broadcast with David Weston is uncertainty. There's never been such uncertainty over the polling, over the outcome, over whether we'll know tomorrow morning when we do this here in Washington. We can be certain about results. one thing, Tom. We can be certain about this. One of the major issues over the last couple of months, in fact, the last year for that matter, <clears throat> has been inflation. Now, what's not clear to me at this point is who they will blame that on. Will it be the White House, the Federal Reserve, or just global issues that have dominated the economy for the last two years? There's no question the inflation is being blamed on President Biden, even among Democrats as, as well. And I think with Bruce Kasman coming on here in a moment, the J.P. Morgan note of Friday was very solid about an ebbing inflation, clearly too late for this election, but even an inflation report Thursday again, with massive uncertainty in the next year. We've had a two-day rally into this vote, <clears throat> Bramo, and overwhelmingly the consensus view on the South side has been divided government, good. Divided government is good for this market. We've got to probe that one a little bit more, haven't we? For how long is it good, right? Is it short-term good? Is it long-term good? If it's long-term, how long does it stay long-term good if you don't have fiscal spending to offset potential downturn? To the point that you guys are talking about who's going to claim credit on the flip side or who's going to, bl who's going to take the blame or who their people are going to blame, who's going to take the credit? If Republicans do win, right, is this going to be Donald Trump sweeping to the next election cycle saying, this is all me? Is it going to be somebody else saying, you know, uh, whether it's McCarthy over in California saying, no, it's because of me? I mean, honestly, the credit game is going to be interesting to watch, too. Did you see the former president has a big announcement, his words, big announcement? to make in the coming week. But he didn't want to take away from J.D. Vance's uh, rally. So of he didn't course, want to suck okay. the oxygen out to announce anything now. So he's going to wait for November 16th, and then he's going to make the well, announcement. I think he sucked some of the oxygen out of the conversation already, Tom Keene, around the midterms. The fact that a former president no looks set it. to get no ready question. to make another run at this. Yeah, no question about it. He's gotten in the way, and particularly for some Republicans in very, very close races. I was shutting down the Round Robin bar last night at the Willard Hotel. <laughs> and, the, you know, it's very strange, folks. For those of you international, and even across this nation, it is strange for me always to be in Washington on an election day. It's sort of an out-of-body experience as a nation. You could describe that out-of-body experience as the <clears throat> show goes on. How about I that? will. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to whip through the price action. Please do. Equities look like promo. this on the S&P 500. Just about unchanged to positive. Up almost a tenth of 1% on the S&P. In a bond market, no action here. No real price action anyway on a 10-year. Just short of 420. Just north of 420 at 420.54. And Bramo Euro dollar here, 99.92. We're down about a third of 1%. Yeah, although I really can't get a sense of direction from anything right now. I'm just, it feels like sort of a hold and wait. Uh, coming up today, we are going to watch Tom Keen out-of-body experience as he is in Washington, D.C. on election. No, I'm just kidding. This is midterm elections, and we're going to be watching uh, everything come out. I'm very curious to see how much the uh, Republicans pick up, both in the House all of the House seats are up, but there really is about uh, 33 races that are toss-ups. 23 are currently headed by Democrats and 10 by Republicans. That's according to the Cook Political yeah, Report. My yeah, my number is 61 of 435. I could be wrong on that, but, but that gets about where you are. But I think that that's what people are assuming, that some of these races might be a lot closer than some people yeah. think. And I think yeah. that that is the balance of power and okay more of the contentious. That was great. I deeply read it. The, the out-of-body out experience was, was just absolute gold. Uh, 1 p.m., this is just for you, because just to have a full out-of-body experience, there is going to be an auction of 40 year, uh, forty oh, billion dollars of 40-year notes. We have an auction in Washington. <laughs> well, this is interesting. Because, look, this is interesting. How much pressure are people going to feel for the Fed to back away from some of what they're doing in the face of the election? Tell yes, me the auction at the cash room over at the, the Treasury Department. We <laughs> exactly. go over there under Gallatin's <laughs> statue and see the auction in the cash. We'll room. go to the Mint and they'll Do just throw money. Right now. Honestly, this conversation is the same every single time. Bramo mentions an auction. 
you start laughing. And she says, but this one is interesting. And let me tell you why it's interesting. <laughs> okay. Is anyone paying attention to this today? <laughs> Let's find out. Okay. If you are, let okay. us know. After market, we do get earnings. They are continuing. Today, Disney, AMC, and News Corp among the notable ones. Disney's going to be really interesting, especially after Netflix beat, right, in terms of the subscribers. How much traction is Disney getting with their online offerings? Yes, and, uh, command or save. That's great. I'm going to just wrap it up there, John. Thank you. Looking forward <laughs> to AMC as well a little bit later. Uh, yeah. Bruce Kasman joins us now, Chief Economist and Head of Global Economic Research at JP Morgan. Bruce, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Is divided government the best outcome as far as you're concerned? Do you have any pushback against that whatsoever? Well, I think divided government means you're not going to get very strong action in terms of things like fiscal policy and in the context of how high our deficit is and how much we've already done, that's a good thing. I think the concern is that if you have a need for action because of a recession or some other crisis, it's going to be hard to see uh, government mobilize. Also, you have to worry about brinkmanship, things like debt ceiling crisis, government shutdowns. Mm -hmm. Those are going to come back into the picture uh, clearly as we move towards next year. Uh, Bruce, we blame politicians for inflation. Can politicians cure high inflation? I think inflation is always an interaction between things happening in the global economy, which are not in the hands of politicians, <clears throat> and also what the political economy, not only the central banks, do in response to that. Uh, and I think what we could say about the inflation spike of the last year and a half is it's not primarily a central bank phenomenon, not primarily a political phenomenon, but how this is going to play out over the next couple of years is largely going to be uh, a re response by policy and how much they're committed to bringing it down. Um, we think that inflation is moving down and it's going to move down in the core number uh, this week and I think will continue, but it's not going to move down by, a, by enough to get us back to 2%. And that's going to require the Fed and unfortunately, probably at some point, require a recession in the U.S. to deliver that unwind. Bruce, Laham, what components are you watching within the inflation print to understand the pace of how much is coming down? Well, I think what we're going to see is uh, really a big dynamic of goods prices moderating. The energy story is going to pop up this month, but it's still on a broad downward trajectory. But I think core goods fall both because supply uh, side pressures around the pandemic are starting to ease. Uh, as well as the dollar having moved up here. We see import prices falling for five straight months in the U.S. Uh, that's going to be magnified by what's happening in the auto sector where prices are coming down. There's also some help coming, I think, in healthcare prices in the CPI. Uh, that's a bit more of a technical issue. But rental shelter price inflation is going to be the factor that's going to keep things up here and prevent us from getting a more substantial fall in the next number of months. We think we're on track for 0 0.4 this week. 0.3s in the next uh, three or four months. That's a significant step down, but it's not bringing us back to where we need to be. Bruce, over the past few weeks, we've been talking extensively about whether a reopening in China, whether an acceleration in the Chinese economy would be a good thing or a bad thing, right? And from a supply chain uh, perspective, perhaps that would be a good thing for the U.S. economy and more broadly uh, because it eases some of those pressures that we're seeing, for example, with the iPhone 14 right now. But on the flip side, there is this question of bidding up a lot of commodities and this question of competition and this question of, well, does that increase demand so much that the supplies can't keep pace? So how do you even begin to think about this? Well, I think the, the, the issue about the supply chain in China normalizing in Asia more generally is a big disinflationary impulse, and that is built into our forecast. I actually think the big story about China is how much is it slowing after a reopening bounce in the third quarter. Uh, the housing sector is problematic. Uh, there still is COVID problems. You know, so if we see China actually slowing quite sharply into year-end, probably growing less than 5%, which for China is a relatively weak outcome. So from our point of view, the bigger issue on China is it's going to be a negative impulse on global demand. Obviously, if it was strong, that would uh, tilt in the other direction on the global inflation scene. Bruce, over the last 12 months or so, this administration a few times has floated some trial balloons around changing policy over the tariffs on China. The one thing that people agree on down here in Washington, D.C., is a strong, tough stance against the Chinese Communist Party. Are you expecting that to change at all after these midterms? Not really. There may be some opportunity for relaxation on tariffs. It's not built into our forecast. Uh, if that would happen, it would help a little bit on the inflation scene. 
Uh, I don't think that's uh, going to be the main story on U.S. inflation, and I don't think it's going to be the main story on U.S. policy, where I think you're correct. I think in tech, I think in other areas, we're getting tougher. Uh, there's more of a, a decoupling taking place here and more, I think, uh, contentious policy that's going to continue in U.S.-China relations. Hey, Bruce, wonderful to hear from you, as always. Bruce Kasman there of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Equity futures this morning up about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Two-day rally, Friday, Monday, into these midterm elections. And, Tom, the criticism of the Federal Reserve, Maxine Waters, mm. Democrat, yes. went after the Federal Reserve on Friday, and not the first, and I assume won't be the last, and the pressure's building in a much bigger way. It is, and, and uh, what's interesting there is I, I place uh, Ms. Waters at 84 years old as away from the Sanders-Warren group. She's okay. much more authentic, glued, no doubt, to the London, uh, the, the Los Angeles mayoral race today, which has got to be front and center for her. But there, there's just no question it is broadening out, and you've got to believe when the results are in and we go through a lame duck session, this is really going to get heated in on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Lisa, I think it's going to be fascinating to see how this criticism builds and how ultimately Chairman Powell responds to it, if he does at all. Because in that news conference last week, I have to say, if that was a rebuttal, it was a pretty strong one well, to these particular politicians. And not just a rebuttal. Also, his line is, in order to have a stable and good labor market, you need to have some sort of stability <clears throat> in the prices, right, in, in inflation. And that is sort of their yeah. argument. It's not reading through. If you take a look at what you're seeing in the polls, if you're seeing what it's taking a look uh, at, at how people are feeling. You know, I just want to emphasize, John, the uncertainty today is extraordinary. It reminds me of 1994. It was just extraordinary just in the last 24 hours. We'll build on that in just a moment. Equity futures right now up around about a tenth of 1%. In the next hour, Anna Hatt of Wells Fargo Good. on this equity market. Looking forward to that conversation. From Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. As millions of Americans prepare to vote today, President Biden admits Democrats face a tougher challenge holding the House than the Senate in midterm elections. Republicans are favored to take control of the House. The battle for the Senate is considered a dead heat. Donald Trump has all but confirmed his widely anticipated third run for the White House. He told a rally in Ohio he would be making a, quote, very big announcement next Tuesday at his estate in Florida. The former president is hoping to take advantage of good election results for Republicans. Russia's heavy casualties in Ukraine reportedly have led to an unusual public outcry. That's according to the Washington Post. The newspaper reports surviving soldiers and family members of the recently drafted troops say their units were slaughtered in poorly planned operations. Russia's defense ministry downplayed the loss of life. The U.S., EU, and Japan will announce a commitment to clean up methane emissions tied to the extraction and transport of oil and gas. It's also a follow-up to a pledge they made a year ago at the U.N.'s Climate Change Summit. At this year's conference, about 40 countries will outline their plans for cutting methane emissions. And Nintendo has cut its fiscal year forecast for Switch console sales by 10% to 19 million units. The Japanese company blames the shortfall in part on a prolonged chip shortage. Nintendo says it's now front-loading production to maximize delivery in the holiday shopping season. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Remember, the power's in your hands. You're one of the reasons why I've never been more optimistic about America's future. I see great nation because I know we're a good people. We just have to remember who in the hell we are. We are the United States of America. Election day in America, the president of the United States, live from Washington, D.C. This is Bloomberg, and it's the price action. The equity market looking a little something like this on the S&P 500. Positive, a little more than a tenth of 1%. Yields lower by about a basis point on a 10-year. 420.33 on a 10-year yield. And there we go, parity again on euro dollar. Parity in yesterday's session, just about holding on this morning. Was... Euro dollar, Tom, negative two tenths of 1%. John, I was surprised. Dollar weakness here, and somebody told me it was back to the beginning of the pandemic, like two, three days in a row of dollar weakness. I didn't realize how unusual that 
It's been. Has it been a while? It's been that long? It's been that long. I, I, I will double check that. that. I did not double know check that either. I Lisa think that's, 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 that's worth confirming. I'll well, look right now. It still is notable, though, that you are seeing dollar weakness after everyone was saying there's no reason for there to be dollar weakness given the uh, unfortunate yeah, position globally. Back. So how much is this technical? How much is yeah. this some serious reset where people are saying the dollar is kind of Quickly, I like, I like what Michael Show said yesterday where he said you got to have a weak dollar to make EM go. Make I thought what really? Michael Shaw had to say about the equity market in America was, for some yeah. people, frightening. Yeah. He yeah. said, if you've bought he the equity market, big tech, at no, some point in the last year, yeah. you're going to be remorseful for the next several years. We are in Washington. Tough. There's a midterm election, which means Anne Marie Horton is front and center, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent, starting the day early, and we'll go this evening into our uh, special coverage as well. I, I want to talk to Anne Marie about some of the vignettes out there, and one of them is in Ohio. Mr. Vance does better than Mr. Ryan over the last number of days. And it's so delicate here about the, the dynamic state to state that the Democrat Ryan has to haul out Dave Matthews on yeah. October 24th <laughs> to get it done. Help me with that. Well, he just doesn't want anyone from the White House, right, or any big name Democrats coming to his state because he doesn't think it's going to help. He is trying to get those voters in the middle, whether they're the middle that lean left, the middle that lean right. He wants them to vote for him. So he knows that for Ohio, this is likely a referendum on the Biden administration. So he rather campaign with Dave Matthews to right. get people out. But what's more interesting about what's going on in Ohio is, of course, what happened last night at the J.D. Vance rally, which might as well have been a former President Donald Trump rally, and which he prompted How to say he has with your, You know, we're amateurs at this. With your perspective, what is the play of the former president, what, John, countdown to November 15th? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, he said it yesterday. He, November 15th, he has a very big announcement at Mar-a-Lago. Did he get in the way of Mr. Vance's efforts? I don't know if he got in the way of it, but he sent, certainly drew more attention to himself than the individual he was going there to try to help promote, which this has tended to happen a few times over the past John, couple of weeks. John, the Dave Matthews Band is a band that plays a birch mirror here. In that's not Fire and Rain. It's, it's not. It's that's not, not Fire. Who plays Fire and Rain? Oh, my God. No, that's James Taylor. Earth, Wind, and Fire, James Taylor. 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 Dave, Dave, Dave is a little bit after that. But so easy to no. trigger we'll you guys. Yeah, yeah I'm triggered. Honestly, I can tell. I know. Relax. Let's talk about this race. <laughs> Inflation's top of mind. We talked about that a million times. Is it clear that everybody blames the president for it? Because if we were to have a nuanced conversation around this table with a group of economists, we'd talk about that fiscal package in early 2021. Right. We'd also talk about central bank policy, and we'd talk about supply constraints around the world. Who do they blame it on? Depends who you ask. So the Republicans clearly blame it on the Biden administration, and they'll bring it back to things like the American Rescue Package. Why were you giving out checks to individuals? If you talk to economists, they say that's marginal in the impact on the final inflation number. And then you talk to Democrats, and they say this is a global issue. And if you look at where the United States stands versus inflation around the world, actually, the U.S. is in a much better shape. We're seeing countries in Europe that have double-digit inflation. And they point to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. They point to supply chain bottlenecks coming out of the pandemic. I loved what Hugh Hendry called it to you, Jonathan, an elephant moving through the body of a snake. That's how he views inflation right now, this one moment in history. But the issue is most voters, like myself, have never actually experienced this kind of price pressure. And you might not realize if your neighbor gets a job the way you would feel when unemployment rates going up. But everyone feels the cost of things going higher, rent, food, and then over the summer, gasoline. So that's the blame story. I'm curious about the credit story, because it's widely expected to be a red sweep or a red wave, right, this idea of Republicans winning. Who gets the credit for that? Is this Donald Trump going to take uh, credit for that on November 15th? Is this uh, some specific candidates who are arguing some sort of true policy to counter inflation? I think we need to see how it shakes out. I think Trump will get credit if his candidates get through, if Blake Masters gets through, if J.D. Vance gets through, if Mehmet Oz gets through, if Herschel Walker gets through. And these are individuals that the minority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, questioned the caliber of these candidates, right? If these individuals get through, I think you can really paint this midterm election as another 2020 presidential election, the sense of the characters of Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. Uh, just quickly, how is a certain governor in Florida feeling this morning after <laughs> that announcement yesterday evening? 
Well, he's probably feeling, like you said the other day, what, they woke up, uh, the worst man in America, feeling like the worst man in America. The, the unhappiest. Yeah, the unhappiest. Well, Donald Trump gave him a nickname the other day, and now, remember when it was... Sanctimonious. Sanctimonious. Yeah, but it's it still came there from after, Pharaoh, the way he talks about me. But, but it came after issue. an ad that Governor DeSantis hey. put out that really was talking a lot about God yeah. and how he was created by God and... Do you and your sources feel that we are going to have debates of eight, nine, ten candidates? Or are we going to get right to two candidates in both parties quickly? No, I think it's going to be it's eight, be, nine, ten. It's going to be a dime. When you already look at the Republican map, it's not just Donald Trump. It's Mike Pompeo. It's oh, yeah. Mike Pence, who, yeah. by the way, November 15th is starting his nationwide book tour. So that was a little dig to his former vice president, I would say, from the former president. And then, of course, you have Ron DeSantis, where all the major Wall Street money is going towards. The announcement for an announcement. Is that what yesterday was? Can we call <laughs> oh, it that? You guys an do, announcement, so, John, an you do announcement. it so much better. You think? I, mean, the, the, you mean, I think I mean, based on the events in the UK over the last couple me? of months, I'm not sure how many people agree with the idea that we do What's it so much better. Times no, the two. UK election is six weeks long. The United States election is Two years, maybe days. four, yeah, exactly. maybe, maybe four, maybe four years. Thirty days is what it is. That's I've ridiculous. covered both. Six weeks, you can handle it. I think it started already. Oh yeah. Uh, never mind. Mr. Trump tomorrow, started. Mr. Biden. When will we hear from Mr. Biden? Whatever the results. When's the pre-announcement? After the midterm elections, but obviously he's been dangling it. He was asked yesterday on a radio show about his age, and what would the eighty-year-old Joe tell the fifty-year-old Joe? And he said. I feel like I'm still 50. Equity futures this I morning. All the time. I'm two tenths of one percent. <laughs> AMH, thank you. You're killing me this morning. Yields down a basis point a 10 year, 41970. From Washington, DC, this is Bloomberg. Live from Washington, here's the price action for you. Going into the midterms here in America, going into the opening bow, three hours away. Equities up by two nice tenths lift. of one percent on the S&P. A lift again on the Nasdaq. Two-day winning streak on the S&P. Friday into Monday. Can we continue the rally going into the midterms? In a bond market, we shape up as follows. Twos, tens, and thirties. Your two-year, holding on to 470. Your 10-year, just south of 420. Your dollar over the last few days has been a whole lot weaker. Tom, here's the stat you wanted. Euro dollar over the last three days, positive 2.6%. big move. That's the biggest three-day mm. pop. Biggest move over the last three days since March 2020. Okay. Euro dollar right now just in and around parity. Thank you for confirming that. That's great. Can I ask a question? You are can we, ask are we any having question a stock you like. market lift getting in front of the inflation report on Thursday, or is it about the election today? One, I don't know, but two, if you want to break it down just briefly, consensus view is that we get divided government, and that's what that's this good. market wants to see. And this no market tax believes. increases that is what is this good. is really about. I would yeah. go one step further than that. No fresh unfunded spending. Okay. which would complicate the effort of the Federal Reserve. Okay. The difficulty I have with the consensus view around divided government being overwhelmingly positive, I understand that might be in the near term. I think Lisa and I have both been talking about this over the last couple of days. I wonder if that holds true in about six to nine months' time from now when we have an economic downturn and there is no buffer coming from anywhere, from monetary policy, Lisa, mm. or from fiscal policy for that matter as well. I would agree with that. And to put a narrative to the recent price action, I would just say this is a range-bound market with a complete lack of conviction. To give any narrative to it at all is ridiculous, simply because, and I will say this, that you're seeing earnings come in weaker than expected. You're seeing downward revisions. You're having a hawkish Fed. And, okay, you might get gridlocked, but this has all been known for a long time. Mm -hmm. So what exactly has changed to create this rally? Maybe technical. I'm absolutely convinced that that's how Lisa wakes up in the morning. <laughs> Bramo just sort of sits up. <laughs> looks forward and those words come out. Yeah, it is. That's Sees true. a chart yes. of the S&P, it's up or something, and it's just like this, you know. this monologue. And everyone's waking up in Casa Bramos, just like <laughs> just my, my kids Lisa's complain up. to you. Lisa's up. That's basically in right. Washington for two days. <laughs> Let me cut this off and get to our good guest here in Washington for two days here for the elections today. And of course, we'll be with you tomorrow morning uh, with some interesting results, to say the least. And part of that, as I was learning at the Willard Hotel, the uh, Ron Robin bar last night, is it's about oil country. Oil country is Oklahoma and Texas for Stephen Shork. President of the Short Group, it's not about Texas, it's not about Oklahoma, it's about heating oil 
in New York Harbor. We're going to go narrow here, Stephen, because sure. it matters to so many of Global Wall Street. Would you explain the why? Why is everybody talking about heating oil in New York and the Northeast? Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, Tom, in the Northeast, it's because 70 percent of the heating oil market uh, homes in, are located in the Northeast. So a significant amount of homes are going into winter and we simply don't have any supply. Why is New York Harbor important? Well, this is because where you make and take delivery on the NYMEX diesel contract, the heating oil contract. And right now we're looking at inventories that are well below normal. In fact, the Pennsylvania Turnpike, Tom, yesterday up in Allentown had a post that their fueling station on the Turnpike was closed because Allentown was out of diesel fuel. We're out of diesel fuel and we haven't even come close to the start right. of the heating season right now. If, if that is the case, can we say it's not in my backyard a distillate refinery matter or is it because the oil went to Ukraine? No, absolutely. It's the NIMBY crowd. We have not built a refinery in the United States since the 1970s. Here in Philly, we had a refinery, Tom, that refined 330,000 barrels of crude oil a day uh, that was operating just three years ago. That is no longer there. So we've cut our refinery capacity here on the East Coast by more than half. That oil has to come from somewhere. Now it comes from Houston. It comes up through the pipelines or it comes up through very expensive barges. Uh, so Steve, we simply don't Steve, have. Steve, 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 yeah. Steve. It comes up from Houston because they won the World Series. Continue. <laughs> yeah. All right. Fair enough. But you know what, Tom? Every time a Philadelphia baseball club, I just read this, I think it was in USA Today the other day. Every time a Philly club, either the A's or the Phillies won the series, the United States went into recession. So maybe the Phils did us a favor here we and are. we're not going to go into recession. But with distillate uh, diesel fuel, the problem here is we don't have the refineries because of the NIMBY crowd. Gasoline is your biggest margin. So what other refiners we do have existing are maximizing their gasoline output at the expense of diesel fuel. So now we're going into winter. We don't have the diesel fuel. Normally, Tom, where we'd make up that difference is a barging it over, tanking it over from Antwerp, from the refinery epicenter there in Northern Europe. But of course, that's not happening because of Ukraine. So now we're in a situation where we simply don't have enough refineries and we don't have enough diesel fuel. But Stephen, a lot of people are saying this is partly because of the political backdrop, because people are not investing and there isn't a consistent policy on rewarding fossil fuel companies for investing in refineries. Other people like Regina Mayer of KPMG saying it's because of Wall Street. Wall Street doesn't want to see these investments. They are not rewarding companies for building new refineries and that's going to keep prices higher for longer. What's your view? Well, I, I'm, I'm partly in agreement with that, Lisa. Uh, and again, we haven't built a refinery in the 19, 1970s, so I'm not going to go down that road saying, oh, we're not building refineries today because of the Wall Street crowd. Uh, that's just a, a fact of, of where the market's been for my entire life. Uh, here. But with regard to your other point, it's well taken. Absolutely. My smaller producer clients, their bankers are telling them, Go find financing. You know, we'll, we'll stick by you now, but in five years, we're only going to stick with the big guys. So this is a very fragmented market right now, and and the, ha the haves and the have-nots are, are going to separate over the next five years. And you are correct. That is the signal being sent from Wall Street, from the banks uh, to the producers. And it's a very scary situation here because we're simply not investing in the infrastructure that we need to. Fossil fuel demand is not going away, people. So we not and we're not investing in our ability to sate this demand. As we could legislate as much as we want. The demand's not going away and the capex isn't there. And therefore, we are in a long term bull market when it comes to fossil fuels. Stephen, just quickly, is the biggest refiner in America still owned by Aramco? Is it still Mativa? Uh, yes, it, it was a joint venture between Mativa and or, or Saudi Aramco and Shell when, when they built it uh, in, a number of years ago. Uh, Saudi has a full ownership of it, and that is the largest and the most probably productive refinery that the United States has right now. You know where I'm going with this. There's a reason I asked that. What do you make of this relationship breakdown between this government, this White House and Riyadh? over the last few months? 
You mean this government and that pariah state over in, in Riyadh? Uh, I think the White House has tipped its hand well on the campaign tra trail, uh, that they were trying to, they were going to cast Saudi Arabia to the side. And now, I don't know if we saw that, that Twitter clip yeah. uh, 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 the other day, no new, I haven't had any new drilling in my yeah. administration, and yet we're going to a pariah oil producer to ask them to increase production. Has he stepped foot, President Biden, in the state of Texas to, to appeal to those producers? I don't think so. Right. Steve, not in my backyard. Is it a political issue or is it like China where Republicans, Democrats, in, independents, they all believe in not in my backyard? So it's really divorced from the election. Which is it? Oh, it's absolutely divorced from the election. This is this is not a Democratic only NIMBY crowd. Uh, the plenty of NIMBYs. I, I I mean uh, on the Republican side, this is a human nature. This is a greed. This is I don't want it in my backyard. I want to preserve my investment, my home, my community, my neighborhood, so forth. So no, this no, this is not a a Democratic rant or anything. No, this is just a, a typical look. I, I love the fact. I used to love the fact I, I'm here in Delaware County in Philadelphia. That refinery was on this on the southern part of, of the, the county. I live in the yeah. northern part of the county, not in my backyard. So uh, we have to be honest with ourselves. But at the same time, mm -hmm. that refinery had been there for 100 years. Uh, we sure yeah. wish we had it now, uh, just a couple of years later. Stephen, on the uh, election day in America, we are looking out at the likelihood that Republicans will possibly increase the ability for, uh, for the U.S. to export natural gas to Europe. How much is that on your radar, the whole NIMBY idea being, we want this in our backyard, we don't care what happens in that backyard? It's a, it's a great question, and and I'll I'll, put, I'll answer it this way, Lisa. Now I think in Western Pennsylvania, the epicenter of the steel uh, 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 industry uh, implosion in the country in the 1970s and the 80s, Shell built an ethylene cracker in Manesson, just north of Philly, where the J and L steel mill employed decades and decades of steel workers. That, that area, Manessing, Alcup, and so forth, is a skeleton of itself. Shell built this ethylene cracker, and it's now bringing life back to that area. It's keeping its young people. It's bringing in engineers. It's bringing in employment. So this is a source of economic growth. And that source of economic growth goes from Pennsylvania, the natural gas epicenter of North America, all the way down to the petrochemical epicenter down in Houston. So yes, that is clearly on, the, on our radar. And in fact, five years ago, when natural gas couldn't break above $20 equivalent barrel oil, we thought, the industry thought, we were building too many LNG export facilities. Now, with natural gas in Europe trading almost $600 barrel oil equivalent, we're saying, oh my goodness, we haven't built wow. enough. So yes, absolutely, uh, we're investing in this. And this is something that, this is the maturation of the natural gas market. It's a, It used to be, uh, people, a market that, I produced it in this area, I put it on a pipeline, and I consumed it at the end of that pipeline. That's no longer the market. I'm going to produce it, put it on a number of pipelines, maybe it'll go to that consumption area, maybe it'll go to the export market. And that is what's attracting the real investment in this industry, and that is the uh, future of the energy market for the next two, three generations. Stephen Shork of the Short Group. Stephen, thank you, as always. Thank you, George. So many Western governments are guilty of what Stephen's talking about. I can look to the UK and across Europe where there is a reluctance to embrace fracking, but they want to embrace the energy that comes from fracking abroad. Yeah. If you go back 12 months, that, yeah. the example in the United States, do you remember COP in Glasgow? Comparing yeah. COP in Glasgow to, was it the G20 in Rome? Or at the G20, they were calling for OPEC to pump more, and COP, they were talking about ending fossil fuels. It's a very try, try and square that circle. It's a difficult policy to get, especially if you don't have a clear message on how much fossil fuels are needed in the short term. Julie Norman's going to join us shortly, the co-director of the UCL Center on U.S. Politics from Washington, D.C., on Election Day, with futures up a third of 1%. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The U.S. votes today in elections that will decide which party controls Congress. Millions cast their ballots in advance. Republicans feel good about their chances to capture both chambers. President Biden admits it will be tougher for Democrats to retain the House than the Senate. Close races mean it could be days before the final result is determined. Donald Trump says he wants nothing to distract from the importance of today's midterm elections, so he's holding off until next week before making what he calls a very big announcement. The former president is expected to declare he'll make a third bid for the White House.
In China, hopes are fading that authorities will lift a lockdown of the area surrounding the world's largest iPhone factory. COVID cases have more than doubled in the city of Junzhou. A seven-day lockdown of the area that houses Apple global iPhone production base expires on Wednesday. The local government may extend the curbs. And Japan is reportedly delaying plans to revise how it taxes carbon. That's according to the Nikkei newspaper. The move potentially slows efforts to wean Japan off fossil fuels. And it comes as world leaders gather in Egypt for the UN's annual climate change summit. Shares of Lyft are falling in pre-market after the company reported weaker than expected ridership growth in the third quarter, suggesting it's losing ground to Uber. The news comes after Lyft said it would cut 13 percent of its workforce, nearly 700 people, in its second round of layoffs this year. Last week, Uber said its ride-hailing customers had rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Inflation should come down, but don't expect its drop to be immediate or predictable. We've been through multiple shocks, as I discussed, and significant shocks simply take time to dampen. That was Tom Barkin, the Richmond Fed president, live from Washington, D.C. Another leg higher in this equity market on the S&P 500, up by, let's call it a third of 1% now, TK. Two-day winning streak, Friday, Monday, this Tuesday morning, pushing higher once again. Yield to lower by a basis point or two, 419.70. Euro dollar, look at that, TK, just for you. Euro dollar, negative two tenths. One zero 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 zero. There it is, like the that. four digits. That's the way we do it on Bloomberg Surveillance. Somebody asked about that. Sometimes with currencies like yen, you go to two digits, and the convention is often to go to four digits as well. We do that for global. Of course, Wall we do. We do that. There's yeah. no question about that. For you and for Wall Street and for everyone Did else. Did anyone actually ask you that? Yeah. We were talking about. Oh yes, it's a serious stuff. Stuff. Carry on. Okay, okay, no idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and right. the way you yeah. quote it, to, you know, we yeah, don't need yeah. to go into it right now. But Let's you know, not. the way you quote foreign exchange is a huge deal. In he the was Bloomberg having that world. out of body moment about the midterm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was talking about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He was Some on a trip that. about decimal points and stuff. Yeah. Like mm. that. yeah. <laughs> it's a long the night. Carry on. The way Julie Norman looks at currency is, you know, sterling down at a 114 is not where it was at 130. She joins us now from UCL, University College of London Center on U.S. Uh, politics, of course, expert in this world of terrorism, but also a student of the American moment. Professor Norman, thank you so much for joining us. And you are focused in on the shifting democracy of America. I'm going to use Arizona on the border with Mexico is the test tube of all this right now. How important is what we learn today and tomorrow morning to the democratic process of the first Tuesday of November in two years? Yeah, Tom, I do think it is going to be crucial for this election cycle to go somewhat smoothly for Americans to just have trust in the system again. And that's on both the right and the left. Um, obviously, coming out of 2020, but going into 2024 as well, we know that there's over 300 election deniers on the ballot today in both state and federal uh, offices. Uh, we knew that many will probably be uh, in office as of tomorrow. There might be some challenges. And uh, and I think many of us are just watching that closely. Obviously, Biden, the Democrats have been really trying to hammer this home. Um, I'm not sure that messaging has stuck. And obviously, other issues are a bit more at the forefront for many voters, like inflation and the economy. Um, but I think both things can be true, that inflation mm -hmm. is driving the votes. But we still have these broader concerns about what this means for the system and if we can restore that faith right. in these institutions again. Witness selective court cases, including one, I believe, in Arizona, literally in the last 48 hours. Do you suggest judiciary to the rescue as we move out two years? Well, I think we saw it in 2020 that the judiciary was really one of the main guardrails and bulwarks against some of these ex attempts to exploit the system. So I do think we can see that again. Again, everyone has the right to challenge results, but if there's no evidence there, that's where the courts come in and, and push back on those allegations. 
I think also uh, I and others are hoping that the reforms for the Electoral Count Act go through Congress. There has been bipartisan support for this in the Senate. Um, I think it will be important to get that over the line before January, um, because that will also close some of the loopholes, mainly at the federal level, but some at the state level, too. And I think that, with anything else, will be a strong outcome from a lot we've heard this year about January 6th and all the aftermath of 2020. Maria today appointed me to an article this morning that I thought was really salient, Julia, about how European nations are kind of sleepwalking to the midterm elections in the U.S. So they're not really fully comprehending what could be potentially the withdrawal of some Ukraine aid if Republicans do get the majority in the House and the Senate, and uh, some potential fissures on certain trade policies. What's your perspective over from Europe's vantage point of how important this election is? Yeah, well, it's interesting you ask that, because here I, I do feel people are asking that a lot. What is this going to mean for U.S. foreign policy? What is it going to mean for Ukraine in particular? You know, we've heard a lot from some on the right and some parts of the Republican Party about not wanting to have this blank check for Ukraine, trying to have some limits to that. Um, in reality, I think that's still a smaller part of the Republican Party. We still have key leaders like Mitch McConnell very much on board with Ukraine aid. You know, 70% of the U.S. population very much on board with that. So I don't see it shifting dramatically in the short term. With that said, I do think there will probably be some increased pressures for accountability on that aid, Republican attempts to tie that to some of their other priorities to get it passed Biden and get some of their agenda items through as well. And quite honestly, I expect that probably not only in the U.S., but across Europe as well, there will start being these domestic pressures to uh, try and figure out what's uh, what's the best way to manage this aid going forward. Um, and I also think, can yeah. Julie, you mentioned Mitch McConnell. I also uh, we're watching for Donald Trump's potential announcement uh, next week on Tuesday when he has a big announcement that we expect to be uh, launching his 2024 campaign. Why are we looking at President Biden and former President Trump as the potential front runners for 2024? All of these people who have been in politics for a long time, even as the rest of the world has moved on and the leader of these parties is less clear now than it was two years ago. Yeah, it's so true, Lisa. And I think both parties, uh, some are at least tankering for a bit of a shift in, in the generational leadership right now. Uh, Biden, you know, I think uh, he has to at least right now project that he is going to run for re-election, whether he actually does that or not. And I think after today, he'll have a bit better sense and Democrats will have a bit better sense of how much they're going to lean into that or maybe start uh, start pressuring him otherwise. Trump, you know, just still has this grip over the party, uh, still just polls so strongly that he just cannot be uh, cannot be ignored. And uh, I think that his momentum and energy will push him forward as well. But we are seeing even his lead chip away a bit. DeSantis and others, you know, are making a stronger case and a stronger run than you know, we would have seen six or 12 months ago. So we are still 12 months out or 24 months out from 2024. So I think a lot can change then. But right now, our focus still is on these two individuals. And I think we can see today as a bit of a referendum on both of them. Julie, we've heard a lot from the Democrats about a threat to democracy, about election denials, about voter suppression. Can you reconcile any of that with the turnout and engagement that we're seeing in American elections? Yeah, well, this is one of the catch-22s, I think, because the public will is still very strong right now for democracy. People are more engaged than ever in the U.S. We're breaking voter turnout records. And I think there's the sense of everyone wants to defend democracy, whether it's uh, from the right in terms of voter uh, election security or from the left in terms of voter access. So I think each side thinks that they are the ones leading the charge to preserve democracy, somewhat ironically. Um, I think the danger is when you have you know, individuals like Trump, uh, some of his allies who kind of exploit that passion for democracy to push uh, lies about a widespread election fraud and push mis misinformation on these things, because it is such a, a galvanizing and motivating thing for most Americans. Julie Norman of the UCL Center on U.S. Politics. Julie, fantastic, as always. Bramo, in certain aspects, both sides speaking past each other on the same issue. Well, that's kind of an evergreen statement, of I would course, argue. I would say that that's not just particularly this issue. Did you see that over uh, over the past couple of days, this one Russian operative came out and conceded election interference by Russia in uh, some of the online kind of communications? And I'm wondering how much that's fueling, forget the side, but fueling the speaking past each other and increased sort of partisanship and animosity that you feel in a lot of the rhetoric. And that conversation likely to continue. Coming up shortly, Anna Han of Wells Fargo on this equity market, two-day rally 
Friday, Monday, continues this Tuesday morning, up four tenths of one percent on the S and P. Live from Washington D.C., heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg. There is some built-in resilience that we're starting to see from the economies. The consumer has the savings buffer. The savings buffer is coming down. I don't think we're actually deglobalizing. I think we're just globalizing more slowly. If you look at that labor force participation rate, it's still stubborn and it retreated last month. That is an issue because that suggests a bit more permanence. This looks like a cycle that the Fed let get out of control. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is election day in the United States of America, live from the nation's capital for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brownwood, I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK, a rally into this one. Two-day winning streak, Friday, Monday, this Tuesday morning, uh, four-tenths of one percent. Rally into it, John. I like your idea from earlier that it's not about the inflation report or maybe disinflation, as Bruce Kasman alludes to at J.P. Morgan, but it is about the good news of gridlock. Maybe it means no tax lift. Maybe it means some, not plan, but some lack of damage from fiscal spending. Or maybe even no more spending. And I think that's the point here, Tom, yeah. about divided government and why this market yeah. is so bullish. Is this a one-day event? Or could this take another four weeks? Particularly, specifically, if we get a runoff yeah, in Georgia and my, have to wait another month. My reading of the last 24 hours is this is possible. I'm not going to predict it that we're going to roll into next week or into December. But you got to believe with 435 House seats, I've got a working number of 60. I believe it's one that are this way or that way or the other. Yeah, the math is there where you're going to have a couple hung seats in the House and maybe even in the Senate. Elise is going to go through the numbers in just a moment. Bramo, I don't think we should park CPI because once we get past this very quickly, we'll be focused on CPI Thursday. Yeah, but I don't know if anyone on Wall Street's focused on that right now because they're all betting sure. on the election outcome and they're no, trying they're to figure out what's going no, on. Stop, and stop. so maybe that's the reason no, why everything is raging. Powerball. Out. Come on, get it straight. They're no. all... Yeah. What's that like, now? Two it's billion? Like, 1.9 billion, I okay. believe, yeah. and, and heading higher, but, you know. I think that... tickets. <laughs> no, Anna Hahn's going to be with us. She's the quant who's done the work on Powerball. Okay. I think that what the quants will tell you is it's not worth playing. Perhaps. But, really? You know, just in terms of the probability of you winning, Tom. Okay. Might be a waste of money. Please continue. <laughs> continue. You have permission to continue. Thanks. I appreciate okay. that. I was waiting for that all morning. I do wonder, though, going forward, once we get past this, whether there starts to be a little bit more of a reality check in terms of the numbers cohering with the action on the screen. I know I sound gloomy. I know I sound doomy. I know that my monologues are we always the same. Small print across but, the screen. <laughs> she's always repeating. It's okay. But hold on. Okay, but, but th this is actually important because we're actually seeing downward revisions that are faster than people expected to 2023 earnings per share. We see a more hawkish Fed. Even Marco Kalanovic is on the border of, like, you know, pessimism about U.S. stocks. So I'm just saying, you know, at what point will this translate into some price action? I, I read Marco yesterday yeah. from JP Morgan talking up international. Perhaps. 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 And UK stocks. I saw that too. But I think that's the international story listed in the UK as opposed to buying the UK economy. But we can have that discussion another time. Equities look like this on election day in America. Lift. Lift. Equity futures up Monday. Rally Tuesday. Will we get more of the same? Equities up a third of 1%. Yield to lower by a basis point. 420. I like seeing euro dollar just there on Lift. parity. Just, just kind of just there. Just dead. Lisa, just one zero 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 zero. It feels like that's how it's meant to be now. Yeah, it also feels, again, like the stasis that the market is today, right? This churn and lack of conviction one way or another. It's just flat. Flatlined. Anyway, okay, here's what we're looking at today. Midterm elections. <laughs> I'm curious about which seats are actually up for grabs. Tom, what did you say? 60? I saw a working number of 61. Those are the lean this way, lean that way, and the real ones in the middle. I think your number was more the real ones in the middle, right. which David Weston and our team will be looking at it. 10 p.m. 11 2. Is Weston here till 2 a.m. tomorrow? <laughs> Probably. Is he so, really? I think so. Yeah, it could be, you know, hung. That sounds like torture. Long. No, I didn't say that. I said it's going to be a long night. Well, 2 a.m. 
Okay. Torture, perhaps, will be the 33 like the races Archie. that the uh, Cook uh, political report uh, has been saying is toss ups. So, okay, well, let's get there. We do have auctions today. $40 billion of three year notes definitely on the forefront of everybody's minds today. I am curious about what we're going to see with respect to yields. It's not the most important auction ever, but it comes at a time when there is this growing expectation of pressure on the Federal Reserve and how much pushback there's going to be to really take off some of the hawkish tilt that you've seen with yields climbing to around the highest going back to 2007. And after market, the earnings does kind of trickle to a close. About nine tenths of a per, uh, nine tenths of all S and P companies have reported. Disney and AMC among the those that are going to be reporting. AMC is going to be interesting. Does it matter what the earnings actually are, John, or is it basically just going to be, you know, if there are enough people saying to buy it, buy it? I have to say, it was the one surprising thing through COVID. If you've asked me if I'd ever go back to the movie theater again, I might have said no. I've been back to the movie theater quite a few times. Really, you have? I have yeah. Yeah. To watch what? Top Gun, Maverick. Oh yeah, that's I think a big I've watched thing. that movie now about four times, and I went to watch another one recently with Marco Robbie, and I forgot what it's called. Is it Amsterdam? Something like that. I, I don't know. That I haven't been that there was much, great. But yeah, you made it to the movies? No, I've been to the movie theater okay. in like 15 years. All right. I mean, I just, I just don't. You don't, get it. don't fancy it. You don't get it. No, I don't get What's it. What's there to get? I, I just, <laughs> I just think room, lots of seats, resolution. big screen. I like sit resolution there, watch and it. the answers we've. Okay, Anna Han joins us now, okay. equity strategist yeah. at Wells Fargo Securities. Anna, She'll save us, saving us right now. Great to have you with us on the program. Anna, talk to me about the view that your clients expect and the outcome that you think will be the most bullish for this equity market from the midterms later. Well. What's more bullish for the market or what the most likely outcome here? You know, they don't necessarily uh, go hand in hand, but in this case, we may be looking at an ideal scenario. Like you guys were discussing earlier, gridlock. Gridlock, we like gridlock because it gives us certainty in a sense. And even if it's not the best news, being able to prepare for it, for example, and like in the earnings season, these are the kind of things that help equity stabilize. And I think that with the gridlock we're expecting, it's going to help put some upward boost on the equity market. Mm -hmm. And, Han, I've been dying to talk to you since the death of the Nobel laureate Ed Prescott. He died of Arizona State University, and he's one that brought physics to economics a good 34 years ago. He talked about the moments, the torque, the, the tensions within the economy. Bring it over right now to the cross moments in your equity space. What do they tell you? Variance, kurtosis, the rest of it, skew. What do they tell you about this unusual moment? I think it's telling you what Lisa mentioned earlier is that the conviction, we're lacking really strong conviction, and that adds to the variance or the volatility of the market. But in these kind of times, it's very frustrating and can be easy to be lost. Where we want to do is position where we think on average you can perform best. And right now, that style has been momentum. You know, rather than get too holed up in one sector or too concentration uh, in a portfolio, if we look sector neutrally and we look at at more of a style that we're looking for, it's high momentum. And that high momentum plays have tended to be uh, those with more reasonable growth. Um, and at the same time, those growth opportunities in a slowing economy and a recession that we expect next year, that's an approach that we'll put our money for. And when you look at a little bit longer term, the question that we've been asking repeatedly is longer term, is gridlock really good for stocks? How do you game out the longer term ramifications of a withdrawal of fiscal spending, regardless of exactly what happens in all of the, uh, the contested elections that we're getting today? Now you bring up a great point, Lisa. Uh, and when we look back historically at previous gridlocks or what we call split elections, uh, we've noticed that there has been some good performance in the one, three, and the six month. Um, but once you start getting outside of that, I think what we start introducing is more what was the economic status of the economy at the time. Uh, and that's really, uh, you start introducing those other variables and you start seeing a little more variance, as we mentioned before, in the outcomes. So in that kind of scenario, where we are today is generally consensus as we start seeing that slowing down of a tightening policy, eventually we'll start seeing cuts. And in a recession, uh, what kind of economic stance do you want to take? And for us, you know, you can take that low volatility, more defensive approach, but really it's going to be that struggle of finding growth that can continue to put up numbers, especially after what looks like a bit of a weak earnings season. Anna, thank you. As always, Anna Han there of Wells Fargo Securities. I think we've all heard the same lines over the last few months about midterm seasonality, about the third year of a presidency being the best year for this equity market. 
Lisa, when you speak to people about that, it just feels different because of what the Federal Reserve Thank is you. doing this Take time care. around. It feels very, very different. I couldn't agree more. We're talking about inflation we have not seen since the early 1980s. We're talking about uh, a potential deglobalization that we haven't seen ever because we haven't really seen this kind of pullback from some of the trade negotiations, at least in modern history. How do you then factor that into some sense of normalcy that you're expecting to reassert itself with a political trend in times of year? Think about the doubts we've had about the rate hiking cycle so far this year. Through the first quarter, we were basically at zero for the whole of the first quarter of 2022. We had doubts about getting Fed funds up to 2% this year, then doubts about getting to 3 doubts about getting to 4 And ultimately, if you said to anybody we could go through 5% on Fed funds, Tom, in the yeah. next 12, 18 months, laughed out of the room. That's all changed. I'd throw another one in there. Mm. Can you imagine me saying to you, Tom, at the start of the year that a week before the midterms, the Fed would hike 75 basis points? No, no, what would you have said to me? Unthinkable. Well, it's happened. Unthinkable. Arthur Burns, unthinkable. What's happened here is they're amending on an ex post basis to what they observe. I spoke to David Rosenberg yesterday out front with the disinflation story. He made clear right now ex rent, ex energy, a lot of inflation mandates are down at 0%, maybe above 0% a little bit. I think what's important here into this election, into this third year, as you correctly state, there's massive unknowns about the inflation story. Rosie's massive. asking the right question, I think, when it comes to inflation. And we should all debate it. Can it fall as quickly as it rose? And we've talked about the chip business. Think of Intel. Think of Qualcomm right now. They've gone from demand, 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 can't make enough of the stuff, to, oh, dear, maybe we've made too much and we need to deliver cuts. Cuts to spending, cuts to hiring, cuts to the workforce. That's a major change as well in just a few months. The problem with it decelerating as quickly as it picked up is we're still dealing with some of the same issues with supply chain uh, supply chain disruptions, whether it's China, whether it's the war in Ukraine, perhaps for different reasons, but that hasn't been completely solved yet. I'd go one step further. We're solving the issues of the previous 12 months and now we've got new ones because they're spreading. Exactly. It's got broader, it's got stickier. From Washington, D.C., an equity market that's rallying on the Nasdaq by six-tenths of 1%. The S&P 500 a bit higher also. On election day in America, heard on radio, seen on TV, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with The First Word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Millions of Americans delivering their verdict today. They'll decide whether Democrats or Republicans have the right ideas to guide the U.S. through inflation, a possible recession, and splits on cultural and social issues. If Republicans gain control of Congress, or even just one of the two chambers, President Biden's agenda would grind to a halt. Donald Trump has all but confirmed his widely anticipated third run for the White House. He told a rally in Ohio he would be making a, quote, very big announcement next Tuesday at his estate in Florida. The former president is hoping to take advantage of good election results for Republicans. And when it comes to its future sources of energy, Ireland is banking on wind. Prime Minister Miguel Martin spoke to Bloomberg at the U.N. Climate Change Summit in Egypt. We have a great asset, it's wind, and wind off uh, the shore in Ireland is particularly strong. Uh, and we are in a position by 2030 to have 80% of all electricity generated by wind. Martin also said that there needs to be new financial tools to help countries deal with weather disasters. Bloomberg's learned that the European Union is preparing to impose more sanctions on Iran over a deadly crackdown on protests. The proposals would target several Iranian individuals and entities. Nationwide protests began in Iran in September after the death of a young woman who had been detained by police for allegedly breaking Islamic dress codes. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Midterm elections are about a referendum on the party in power in the White House. Most of the time, that party loses seats. You know, when you have such division, you're going to switch control of the chambers a lot more frequently. You know, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have as much division. And so, you know, it's harder to flip control. 
Wendy Schiller there, the director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy at Brown University. Equities look like this in the equity market on the S&P 500. Futures advancing on the S&P, on the Nasdaq too, with yields looking a little something like this as well, 421.81 on a 10-year. Right now, equity futures up two-tenths of 1%. Euro dollar, a small break of parity at 99.90. We're negative a third of 1%. Tweet of the morning. Won't reveal the name because I don't know if he wants me to, but here's the tweet. Tough decision. Do I vote for the party who nominated Jay Powell for Fed chair or the party who renominated <laughs> Jay Powell for Fed chair? Tom saw that tweet about two minutes ago. Thanks for paying attention. I am. Cheers. I am. Appreciate it. Do you want this one too? I, no, I Do you want the chances of winning the Powerball? <laughs> one in 292.2 yeah, million. Two million. Cash but values 585 after tax. <laughs> Try it in <laughs> some places. Seriously, Someone the was pretty Powell. sweary at me on Twitter yeah. about the odds for Powerball because actually it's one in 292 million and the cash value could be 585 as a lump sum in some states. So perhaps it is worth it You're just to, to, to take a punt. That was, that was from someone on Twitter. The next line's pretty sweary, so I'm what, not going to read it out. But to your point, it out. Powell, what does he want out of this election? That really has not been addressed. Oh, I don't think he wants to address that, yeah, Tom. But I think they'd love some certainty on, on fiscal policy I so agree. they can get I their think act that's together. On the, the QT side. The view on Wall Street, and let's go through it piece by piece, and I've, I've gone through the caveats around it because I don't 100% buy into it, and I don't think everybody does either. There is a consensus view on Wall Street that divided government is good because you'll have fiscal policy that is restrained, and that means we can get a better idea about monetary policy. All of this is about policy clarity. That's all it's about. In QT clarity. That's all it's about. I don't That's think we've got about. any clarity on QT. Exactly. Does Maybe that continue into 2023? No idea. Right now, joining us from Arkansas, he's been a wonderful support to the show. His name is French Hill. He is the Republican from Arkansas waiting for election results tonight. I don't know, French, if I can say widely presumed, but at least I can say in the zeitgeist is a Republican victory. French Hill, will the victory tonight be like the shock that we saw in 1994? Well, Tom, Lisa, Jonathan, great to be with you. You know, I don't think it will be the shock we had in 1994 because Republicans hadn't been in charge uh, in the House of Representatives uh, for 40 years at that point. So we've seen the uh, House flip before in the last decade. House Republicans are ready uh, to lead on trying to control inflation, go back to pre-pandemic spending priorities, lead on unleashing American energy, and focusing on security, security in our communities, at the border, and the challenges that we face uh, around the world as the largest superpower. How is your party in majority in the House distracted by former President Trump, who has every right to run again, but distracted by that moment? Well, President Trump is a fighter. President Trump has strong views, and there's no doubt that members of Congress uh, many members of Congress follow uh, his views on topics. And so if he weighs in on a topic in the midst of a, uh, a debate in the House, I don't have any doubt that he would have uh, influence inside the Republican Party. Look, that's the mission of Kevin McCarthy, who I expect to be elected as the Speaker of the House if the Republicans take uh, control tonight. And Kevin will have that responsibility to build a consensus among a majority of Republican members <laughs> on how to go forward on these critical issues. French, there's a, uh, an assumption in markets and beyond, certainly in Europe, that Republicans right now are less excited about continuing some of the aid to Ukraine and want to focus more on reducing inflation domestically, on keeping natural gas here in the United States. What's your view on that? Should there be some sort of restriction on exports if prices do rise beyond a certain amount? Well, we do face a tough uh, winter in energy markets uh, with rising prices, and we don't have supply where we want it. I think the president's uh, proposal of cutting the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve by 200 million barrels down to a 1984 level was a bad and dangerous policy, and this is exactly why, Lisa, because that Strategic Petroleum Reserve is in case of major shortage and impact on the U.S., so I think <coughs> he's contributed to this but energy crisis this winter by that decision. In, in all fairness, though, natural gas is a different story, right? And the natural gas exports from the U.S. is really what's yeah. in question because that's really uh, what Europe and Germany in particular really needs right now. So what would your stance be I, on the threshold to restrict some of that of those exports? 
Well, I wouldn't restrict uh, exports unless we were in an absolute energy emergency here, which we have, uh, we need to be smart about, and that's why I raised uh, the reserve on the oil side. But look, Europe needs natural gas, and Joe Biden's been <coughs> terrible on producing natural gas here. He's taken a lot of decisions that have made it very hard uh, to get our energy industry back up to pre-pandemic production, and with a positive outlook that production will produce a solid internal rate of return in the future, because we need to be having our natural gas here, but we need to be exporting natural gas in this energy crisis to our allies in Europe. Congressman, isn't the damage done? Even if we get a Republican Congress from these midterms, if you're an oil producer right now trying to make multi-decade decisions, as far as they're concerned, isn't this story over? Well, uh, I don't think so, Jonathan. I think we have to be for and all of the above energy policy during this transition, whether you're in Europe or the United States or in Asia. We need to be moving to natural gas uh, from coal. We need to be investing in nuclear. And we need to have our energy companies uh, recognize, and governments have to recognize, that it takes a 100 million barrel a day equivalent to run the global industrial economy and to prematurely cut that back or injure it without the uh, offsetting cleaner alternatives, you're in trouble as an economy. And the third world will pay the highest price, not only from exporting America's inflation, uh, but by these policies that curtail the use of energy in the third world. Congressman, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. French Hill, as always, on Bloomberg Silence. You bet, John. Great to be with you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Coming up at 8.15, we'll be catching up with Congressman Peter Welch, the Democrat from Vermont. Looking forward to that conversation as well. Lisa, just briefly, what did you make of those final comments on energy just there? It's a very difficult thing because we've heard from the likes of uh, a, a host of analysts saying that Wall Street doesn't want to invest. So how do you get an investment longer term when you have policies that are inconsistent but definitely moving away from fossil fuels for those investments that he's asking for? I just struggle with this analysis. I think the outcome of one midterm election is not going to give these oil producers the clarity to make multi-decade decisions. That's troublesome. I think a lot of people would agree, which is the reason why you're not necessarily seeing Wall Street open the purse strings as well and help the cause. Coming up, Mark McCormick, the global head of FX strategy at TD Securities. Looking forward to that conversation with Euro dollar in and around parity at 99.95. Equity futures up by two tenths of 1%. On election day in America, this is Bloomberg. Election day in America, equity shaping up as follows. On the S&P 500, just about positive, up a little more than a tenth of 1%. On the NASDAQ 100, positive also. In the bond market, we look a little something like this. On two tens and thirties, your 10-year yield is down by not even a basis point at 421.18. Your two-year, 472. Remember, shortly after the payrolls for a heartbeat, we got very close to 480 on a two year shortly after the payrolls report. Then we backed away 472 now still levels. If you take out last week levels we haven't seen since 2007 in the FX market. Look a little something like this bit of weakness for the US dollar recently euro dollar back down below parity <coughs> down a third of 1% Tom 99 91 on euro dollar off the last uh, number of days. I'd say off the radar after an exhausting three months in the dollar market. We're going to get a briefing here. As we move the election, I guess with the election angle, it's just simply a belief in strong or resilient uh, dollar, and we'll just have to see, John. Yeah. And it's just plain and simple. You take uh, it over the last three days, Lisa. What is it? Euro dollar. Shift. Worst three day period going back to it's 2020. Yeah. I didn't know until TK said it. Didn't realize that's how much well, I didn't know until received. I read it somewhere. And I steal the, from anybody every time I can. <laughs> you know. The amazing Good thing is, you. it's not Thank even you. that much. It's a secret. <laughs> He's going to keep going. The secret <laughs> is that you steal. <laughs> that's, that's what makes it amazing. Look, we, get right, we should stay to people that our day starts about 1 a.m., maybe 2 a.m., because as Global Wall Street's writing, particularly in London, in their morning, we have to keep up. Well, and I will say that the dollar has been one big headwind uh, for a number of stocks, although I wouldn't necessarily say it's just because of the, uh, the stocks that I'm looking at. What I think is interesting, as we get to the end of the earnings season, John, 
in Tom is the sense of consolidation among the biggest and the strongest players. And that is what we're seeing. The strongest continue to do well and the losers are significantly losing. Lyft shares down more than 16% after reporting earnings that were somewhat disappointing in terms of how much they grew their uh, their ridership. How much is this because of that disappointment? How much is this because Lyft is losing to Uber? That you're seeing Uber consolidate a lot of the market share. Is that the consensus view? Lyft is losing to Uber? Is that sort yes, of the, which in is the, the game? Yes, which is the reason why shares of Lyft before this move were down 66% so far this year. Again, you're seeing that story, story with TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor uh, shares are down more than 20% in pre-market trading after reporting earnings that disappointed with disappointing guidelines, even though you're seeing the airlines post some pretty insignificant gains. People are still traveling. TripAdvisor is not getting that, partly because of Viator and a whole host of other things. But again, consolidation among the strongest and big losers uh, among the weaker ones. And Disney is uh, going to be reporting earnings after the bell, shares of about a half a percent. I'm just curious to see uh, what the investment is like in content. Remember, Tom, when we were talking about peak content, that content is king, but then at a certain point, uh, maybe not so much. You know, Paul Sweeney's expert on this. I'll be with him at 9 a.m. on radio this morning. And he just says the gloom crew got it wrong. It's more gloomy than even the gloom <laughs> crew thought. Do you want my he rant? He looks at Warner Brother Discovery, sure. the Roberts family, Comcast, and the rest, and he says it is brutal. Disney, Hulu, you ready for this? I got a Dear John email from Hulu the other day. The price of Hulu is going up to $82.99 from $75.99. Didn't we cut the cord because of cable costs? And oh, I don't get me going. Package costs? Don't I have to be clear, I've talked about this before. I cut the, ca the cord because I like the look of the TV without the cables and the box. We, we all know. We talked it's about aesthetic, that before. Yes. But the price of that <laughs> is ridiculous now, Tom. The price of that... You throw in some fast high-speed broadband in New York City and all of a sudden you're paying some significant money oh, yeah. to it's get broadband racket. and live TV. Yeah. He's Thank looking you. for bundling and what kind of bundles <clears throat> will actually work and I can am. you get oh. something. So you're basically saying anyone out there who wants to bundle something and offer you a price. Well, I just don't need the box anymore. Yeah. I know they do the streaming themselves. Just, you know, give me the bundle and I'll... I'll pay Enough. for that. And well, they tried that. Without the strings it attached. Work. Literally, like without the strings, strings attached. No <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nice. It, it, it is a wild west. I mean, that is the it's way to ridiculous. look at it. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I defer to Sweeney, who's truly globally known on this. And the answer is, uh, you know, we don't know. We'll talk to Michael Nathanson, Rich Greenfield, and others about this. Right now on Foreign Exchange, and we have paused the last number of days, and we take great pride in how we cover the dollar in foreign exchange here at Bloomberg Surveillance. And we are advantaged by Mark McCormick. He's global head of FX strategy at TD Securities. He's been incredibly on about resilient dollar. Mark McCormick on election day, let's start there. Do you believe in a strong dollar? Yeah, we still think the strong dollar theme is is in play here. And I think we have until probably maybe Q2 of next year. Um, I think one of the things that you think about three themes that matter for the dollar, it's global growth, which is Europe and Asia. It's basically the Fed's terminal rate exploration, which has actually gotten more hawkish and, and stronger for the dollar. And the global turn to trade shock, which is something we still have to deal with through the winter in Europe. So I think what's interesting is that while markets have kind of pivoting uh, away from the dollar resilience recently, especially the last two weeks, uh, most of the things that we're tracking that look at underlying growth and Chinese growth and European growth, these things are actually have gotten worse in the last two months or so. So I think you take that along with the Fed being more hawkish and our expectations of a five and a half percent terminal rate into Q2 of next year. We still have what feels like an environment where you should be fading these do the dollar weakness right now. How has your world changed with a risk free rate, as Taleb says, with the gravity returning to physics? the carry trades, the mathematics changes. Explain that to our audience. Yeah, the carry trade, I think, is a simple way. I, most people, I think, classify it as dollar cash is king. Uh, no one wants to take duration risk. Equities, you know, if you look at sharp ratio, how things are doing relative to volatility is, has plummeted. So if you look at a risk-free asset at the front end of the U.S. curve, adjusted for inflation, you are compensated uh, better than you would in other asset classes. So the easiest way to think about the dollar is it offers great risk return profile in cash, and it's also a great hedge to stagflation or what you would call basically underperformance in equities. I'm going to ask the dumb question of the day, Mark. But earlier today, John and Tom were asking, why is the dollar weakening? Why have we had three days of the biggest weakening going back to March of 2020? And I just reject it outright as any kind of trend that you can give a narrative to. Do you think that there is something that people are buying into that's behind this? 
Yeah, so I, I spent a last, uh, the last week traveling, uh, meeting clients across Europe, and the number one thing that people were asking about is China. And then you had like a, a series of interesting headlines. Some of them s didn't really have much flavor to it, but it basically pointed in direction. And then you had the big news on Friday uh, that there could be some, you know, some movement towards an mRNA-based vaccine moving into in China. I think the big hope for people is that China can durably reopen sooner than what uh, markets were anticipating. I think it's a bit of red herring. I think it's we're not heading in that direction where China can convincingly reopen very aggressively very soon, uh, given the low vaccine uptake. But I think that is a big part of the narrative. And the other side of it is the terms of trade shock in Europe looks a little bit better than it did months ago. Uh, the fill levels are high for natural gas. Uh, energy forwards have kind of collapsed a bit. And if you look at even within our models, the terms of trade has improved. But that does not really get us through the flow concept of where we need to go through for the winter. Uh, so I, I do think there's been some positive news as you look to Europe and particularly Asia. But it's really, to me, it's not strong enough and yet convincing enough to kind of change the macroeconomic fundamentals, which still favor the dollar, especially on, on the Fed side now, uh, since it looks like they've gotten even more hawkish last week. Mark, I want to sit on the first point, that this could be due to the prospect of China reopening. How much could that cause the dollar to weaken? How dramatic of a move do you expect if there is some sort of material shift toward relaxing COVID zero in China? It's a great question. Uh, as a risk analysis, I'd say we look at our global stagflation proxy and dollars about 6% overvalued in broad terms. So you include G10 emerging markets. Um, also, if you look at it relative to, to stress and, and stagflation, it is about, I'd say, 6 to 10% overvalued. So if we do get the like reopening in China and it seems like it's confirmed, there's mRNA vaccines going and uh, they're going to open the floodgates in Q2, that would be a significant decline in the dollar. Like we are forecasting about a 10, 15% drop in the dollar towards the back half of 2023, but we're coming into it from what would be stronger levels. So that against our base case, uh, that would be significant. I think you could see the dollar drop another five, six percent in the next couple of months if China were to reopen. Wow. Uh, there's a call. Mark McCormick at TD looking for dollar weakness off the back of a China reopening if we get one. Goldman was talking about a 20 percent rally in Chinese equities if we got one. Some big calls here. Mark, thank you. I want to spend a bit of time going through something Mohammed Al Arian has just put out on Twitter because I think it's a, a series <clears throat> of important points that he's trying to make. The conventional wisdom is, understandably, that the consensus forecast of a gridlock America after today's midterms will keep the government out of the way of markets. He goes on to say, yet the economic context calls for smart government policies for vulnerable segments of the population, for global policy leadership, etc., to help enhance the economy's ability to grow strongly, sustainably and inclusively, especially as a late Fed seeks to contain inflation. The two combined means that a gridlock would quickly shift attention to the next election in two years and that the length and depth of a possible recession would have quite an influence. Now, I want to pick up on that final point. A lot of people talk about short and shallow. And the reason they say shallow is because they don't believe we've built up enough excess over the last couple of years, which would deliver a deep downturn. But on the short side of things, Tom, I think that if you don't have any kind of counter cyclical circuit breaker from fiscal or from monetary policy, I think the debate's a little bit more wide open when it comes to oh, a so duration wait, wait, of a downturn. Absolutely original uh, debate right now. It's completely opposite of any other measurement of like the double recession of Volcker or the 2001, I believe it was, mini recession we almost had. I, to push against what uh, Professor Larian is saying, I would suggest Washington badly likes gridlock because gridlock raises money. And to me, that's the beast that is where we are, and they will be enthused to have gridlock because it'll give them a reason to uh, earn the marginal $1 million of donations. I remember when I was in political science classes in college, and I used to get really frustrated because it was just so messy and nothing ever got done, and it felt like it was inefficient. And someone once said to me, inefficiency is the reason why the country works. Because when you have something that's too efficient, you get a radicalization of we a call government. That the British approach. So, <laughs> so there is something to be said for some kind of back and forth sure. and gridlock. The problem is when there needs to be a fiscal response, where is the honest discussion about how to achieve the best outcome without trying to push some sort of partisan two-year cycle? I wondered how many digs you'd take at the British system whilst oh, we were here. Oh, but she's talking about it. I mean, that's how we invented I wasn't this talking about the British system. It wasn't you, Lisa. <laughs> Madison turned to Jefferson and said, we need gridlock, Tom. <laughs>
equities. <laughs> you were there, a no, tenth of one percent on the S and P. <laughs> Live from Washington, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The U.S. votes today in elections that will decide which party controls Congress. Millions cast their ballots in advance. Republicans feel good about their chances to capture both chambers. President Biden admits it will be tougher for Democrats to retain the House than the Senate. Close races mean it could be days before the final result is determined. Donald Trump says he wants nothing to distract from the importance of today's midterm elections, so he's holding off until next week before making what he calls a very big announcement. The former president is expected to declare he'll make a third bid for the White House. And the former governor of the Bank of England says renewable energy assets are set for an era of growth. Mark Carney spoke to Bloomberg at the UN Climate Change Summit in Egypt. There's an absolute wall of opportunity uh, in just rolling out clean energy at scale. I'll give you one fact. I work at Brookfield part time um, and we have gone from 20 gigawatts in our pipeline of building out renewables to over 100 in just 12 months. That gives you a sense of how fast things are moving. Carney is now the co-chair of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. In China, hopes are fading that authorities will lift a lockdown of the area surrounding the world's largest iPhone factory. COVID cases have more than doubled in the city of Zhengzhou. A seven-day lockdown of the area that houses Apple's global iPhone production base expires on Wednesday. The local government may extend the curbs. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. It is going to be crucial for this election cycle to go somewhat smoothly for Americans to just have trust in the system again. Inflation is driving the votes, but we still have these broader concerns about what this means for the system and if we can restore that faith. Wonderful to hear from Julie Norman, the UCL Center on U.S. Politics co-director, live from Washington. Equity is just about positive on the S&P 500, up a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P in the bond market. We look like this, yield to lower by, let's call it a basis point, Tom, on a 10-year, 4.2054. Euro dollar 99.93, negative a third of 1%. And crude is getting a ten, ton of attention in this election, yeah. what's happening in the energy market. WTI, $91, and let's call it 10 cents. We're down, Tom by three quarters of one percent. It made a dash and then it's pulled back, but still, I would suggest for a huge body of Americans, and I looked at this yesterday, from 2019, price up in that gas, as Steve Shark mentioned, price up in diesel and heating oil, gallon of gas up, I can't remember the number, I'll say it's 100 percent plus. These are huge, huge moves. It's a massive, massive task to try and reconcile the two messages coming out of the administration right now, which is one, drill more, and two, no more drilling. That's a difficult one to thread. It, it is, and even in the last couple of days out on Twitter, there's been discussion of our interview with Secretary Granholm of 12 of a months long, ago. Of a long, long time ago. Of a long, long time ago. And for the people that are, I'm going to say, pro hydrocarbon as a general statement, they haven't forgotten. You know, they just all there is I to it. I don't think we have. A year ago, that was a bizarre conversation. Well, we've had a few. Months ago. We've had a few. That was up there. Yeah, we both Republicans and Democrats. We've been fair and balanced a, a, about a strange time. Actually, with the conversations that John and I have with Lisa, you know, it can get bizarre as well. It's a strange you show, know. TK. It, it, can we it, move on, we could, please? We could, a brand just, just says move a on. We're just having a moment. Just a moment. <clears throat> Saving us today, Anne-Marie Horton, Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Anne-Marie, as usual on Election Day, the writings are extraordinary. There's any number of people out at any number of news organizations. I always turn to Matt Bai. He's at the Washington Post with a terrific essay today that the Democrats have to stop with the navel-gazing. There is no, his book, The Argument from years ago, there is no argument. It's the time they live in. For the Democrats, it was the cards they were dealt. Well, at the moment, it is the cards they're dealt in terms of, I mean, if you're talking about the energy story, that's one of them. Mm -hmm. They came into this administration with a rhetoric that did not match the moment 12 months later, right. which was the fact that there was an invasion of Ukraine. They were taking out uh, 
a commodity superstore that's in Russia. And speaking of energy prices, today on Election Day, they're actually busted out of the 70s. It's 3.80 in average. And this is something the White House is obsessed with mm -hmm. because this has reflected the president's poll numbers. What about the Republicans in that Mr. Trump is out again talking of November 15th and, and such? What is the argument in, where there's really no message for them? They have to live with the cards the Republicans were dealt. Yeah, they have to live with the fact that he is still the highest ranking and the leader of their party. And many of them would like to put that era behind them, but they just can't. He's out there at rallies for these individuals he's campaigning for that okay. many in the Republican Party is, would not like to see. And he is going to announce a bid for the White is House. Is he going to say the, the governor of Florida is a Republican in name only? We don't know. Right now, all the thing he's saying that he's Ron De Sanctimonious. That's his name for him. He hasn't said he's not. He's a rhino yet, but he is giving him a nickname. So maybe we're one step there. We're one step there. <laughs> and Marie, just picking up on the point that you made about gasoline prices and oil, I am curious about the the U.S. relationship with Riyadh, with OPEC Plus, especially as we see those prices continue to rise. OPEC Plus today defending some of their supply cuts because they are coming more into focus now that prices are rising again. How strained is that relationship? What is the implication for policy, given your deep knowledge, I know, of Riyadh as well as the U.S.? So when it comes to the oil market, the U.S., and after that cut, they said that they were going to recalibrate and review. But then we had, we had a story I worked on, and this was after the Wall Street Journal wrote, reported it, that the Saudi and the U.S. were sharing intelligence about a potential imminent threat from Iran. So you do see that on some level the communication flow has not stopped. But obviously this has been an acrimonious relationship between the Biden administration who wanted to make this country a pariah and the Saudis. But the Saudis are going to defend and Prince Abdulaziz did this the other day at the FII, quoting a story I wrote that uh, when I was there before the lockdown of all these governments, he said you can either take a fire hose to a house, right? Save the house, but you still have your furniture. Or you call the fire brigade, and you maybe, you ruin everything, but you save the structure. And that's what he wanted to do. And I think that's what he was trying to get at in this cut, that they needed to make the cut now because China was still locked down and there are recessionary fears. There is a defensiveness. The Oman's uh, minister came out this morning just crossing the OPEC plus cuts have balanced the oil markets and prices. This is their argument, right? Uh, and then also saying that OPEC plus can respond more if prices do rise. What is the trigger point and what's the pushback that you get both internally as well as just internationally? nationally, given the frayed relationship and given the reluctance to really let prices go too low? Well, OPEC doesn't think the physical market right now reflects what's going on in the paper market. But also, we have to remember, December 5th is a really key date for the oil market, which means that is when, if there is no price cap, we could potentially see shut-ins on Russian oil. Right now, Russian oil is still flowing, but December 5th, that might be impacted. And you could argue that some of these OPEC countries, like Saudi Arabia, which was pumping at capacity for months, wanted to maybe take a break, some others maybe rest their fields, so they have some dry powder when this happens in December, and if prices do spike because of this. Politically, November is going to turn out to be really interesting, not just because of energy, but also the outcome of those negotiations Negotiations between the administration supporting the railroad unions mm -hmm. and the agreement, the tentative agreement that we had about a month or so ago, which hasn't been signed by all 12 unions. No. And I believe we could have some, some activity there, perhaps in the next couple of weeks. It could mean strikes, potentially. And that would mean issues of, mm. especially for things like food, also become incredibly dangerous. Things like pneumonia just can't be sitting on a railroad. Right. Not just that in November. One more deal we're waiting on, November 19th. This is the grain deal, the Black Sea grain deal, whether or not that's going to continue or not. Right. That is crucial for food inflation. 20 seconds. Is, are unions voting Republican or Democrat? I think General they vote statement. for the Democrat, Joe Biden. He is a union man, and we recently ran a piece about his inflation advisors, and really there's not been the outreach we've seen to labor leaders that we've ever seen under a president as we have under Joe Biden. MH, thank you. Wonderful to be with Anne-Marie. And this is like Welcome. Kaza, it's nice this to is have you guys here. You know, every 10 days. We're in AMH's home. Yeah, we are. It's so it's, you know, thank you for having us. Every 10 days we should be here. Great Seriously. breakfast here, too. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, this yeah. Is real, the best real upgrade on the Seriously, food. Seriously, this is, real you know, this is what matters is the food in the Washington Bureau folks 
His overtake in Tokyo was the best in the Bloomberg world. Frankfurt was up there too, you know. Frankfurt was up I, there. I always like Frankfurt. Yes. Fresh can fruit, I, sliced fruit in the morning. Plus, they three hour lunches. Can yeah, I good. follow on to the, the, the sort of uh, the, the, the rail, the rail uh, strikes? Oh, you want to talk about something serious? Well, it's not Excuse just me. the US, it's also in Canada, it's also yes. in the UK. And what is it about the rail system? I don't know. I think that that's so interesting. I know, we can keep talking. We can talk about it in the break. Okay. Let's Futures see. right now. Up yeah, to join us on the, the break, Just real <laughs> entertainment stuff <laughs> in a commercial break. <laughs> From Washington, D.C., this is Bloomberg. Markets prefer gridlock generally to one party having control of all the levers of power. Inflation will come down over the course of the next year. It's also likely that future levels of inflation are more persistent. What do we know so far about the inflation call? Everybody's gotten it wrong. Fiscal stimulus from 2020 and 2021 is still going to act as a buffer for 2023 and 2024. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen from the nation's capital. It is election day. A midterm election, we're briefed, it's not as important as a presidential election. John, in this environment coming out of this pandemic, I don't buy it for a minute. It's important. Well, it certainly sets the stage for the next general election anyway, and I think that race has already started. Overwhelmingly yes. on Wall Street, gridlock is the view. Gridlock is the view that's best for this market. There's been some pushback out there. We should highlight it. We should have that conversation. Mohamed Aleri and talking about the potential depth, breadth, and duration of a downturn without targeted fiscal policy in the year to come. And, and gridlock would prevent that from happening. The uncertainty is there, and we're not going to do, you know, the, what the other networks are doing, which is the pay-by-play -play of Arizona or what's going on in Pennsylvania and that. But the value add, John, I think we can bring for our global Wall Street audience is the character of the gridlock around Washington policy and particularly what it means for the degrees of freedom the Fed has, they're limited with a difficult election There's today. an additional dimension here as well. I think if you're on Wall Street, many people just want the event cleared. They want to get it yes, out of the way, totally move agree. on, focus on yeah. CPI. When you look at the polls in a place like Georgia at the moment, and we've discussed this over the last few weeks or so, it looks like that could go to a runoff. If it goes for a runoff, we're talking about another four right. weeks of this. So potentially, Tom, we don't clear that hurdle anytime soon. Let's, Lisa, let's dovetail Thursday, tomorrow, or excuse me, two days out inflation report with what we see today, inflation front and center. French Hill was with us from Arkansas, chicken through the moon like every other food group in the store. Well, so yeah, chicken through the moon, a lot of things to put together, incredible imagery there. I am curious to see how the inflation report really affects the Republican discussion discussion point, especially taken away from the midterm elections. We were speaking with Congressman French Hill about the potential emergency in natural gas. If prices go too high, at what point do you start restricting exports? At right. what point do you start saying, we can respond with more spending the way Germany is or not? Because spending was what got right. into this to begin with. Factoid of the morning for me was Stephen Short, John, saying with all that's going on, Nat gas or some form of hydrocarbons in Europe is $600 a barrel equivalent. I mean, we've got it bad, but nothing like the economic and inflation dynamics of Europe. Well, I think this is the important conversation we need to have. What's taking place over the next 24 hours has consequences not just for the next few weeks, but potentially for the next few years. And what we're looking at what happens in Europe right now, Tom, I think is really important because it's not about this winter. It's about next winter now. They got their storage levels up. And you can see that reflected in gas prices in Europe yeah. right now. They've rolled over largely because storage is basically at capacity. Can you repeat the act that they engineered this winter, which is to get storage up by using Nord Stream? Where does the gas come from next winter to do the same thing? Yeah, tremendously that, difficult to do. And not just that, but also how about the, all the other nations who haven't had the luxury of building up some of those stores? And I'm thinking of yeah. certain developing nations that are seeing their prices surge to record highs because Europe is sucking it all up. And we haven't even talked about China, which uh, is the only thing they agree on in Washington, I think, today, other than 
you know, the line at the Starbucks sure. will be long on an election day. John, let me get the data check started here. 4.71 percent on a two-year yield. No one a year ago would have guessed that. Well, let's talk about the equity market as well, because we've got a little bit of a rally coming into decision day. Friday, Monday, Tuesday morning, up another quarter of 1 percent. The turnaround of the bond market, 4.2054, basically unchanged. But, Tom, to your point, where were we 12 months ago? The yeah. change in this yeah. bond market has just been monstrous delivered by this Fed. And, John, this is important. It's off the radar of politicians, but to their electorate of all different walks of life. The Pew Research Trust talks about nine groups of Americans. All nine groups are affected by this data. So this is really important on the inflation point. We all know that inflation is a major, major point in this discussion around voting in America in the midterms. What's not completely clear to me is how many people blame the White House for that. Now, we know the Republicans do, but what about the Democrats? We have a nuanced conversation on programs like this. You've got the White House, you've got monetary policy, you've got the global supply constraints of the last couple of years and the pandemic and everything that's happened in places like Ukraine and Russia. It would be interesting to see who of the Democrats, who do they blame that on? Do they turn to the White House and... Do they blame it on well, the White that's House? that's in the zeitgeist this morning. I mentioned Matt Bay in the Washington Post. I think David Weston will have a lot on this with our coverage that you'll see uh, tonight beginning at 8 o'clock. Right now, we drive forward the conversation with a <clears throat> Beltway insider with Rock Creek Group. Alifia Dorwalla joins us now, their managing director. Thank you so much for getting up. It's way too early for I mean, even on Election Day, Washington doesn't get up till 8.30, do they? Oh, no. We're, we're up. We're finance people, so we're up. It's exciting. Explain Election Day in Washington. French Hill was in Arkansas, as he should be today. Is, is Washington deserted on Election Day? You know, I don't know if it's as exciting as people want to think Washington is on Election Day. Everyone's working from home anyway, especially the government. So I don't know if we are getting a lot of excitement today. And I think markets are, as you said, pricing in a little bit of a split, um, you know, Congress and what that means for markets. What are the risks around that view? From your perspective, is that good or bad? Because we're told overwhelmingly it is good. You know, I mean, it could be in good. It could be, right, less inflationary pressure because you don't have as much fiscal spending. You could see a weaker dollar. All of those things could price into markets and, um, you know, be, being a little bit more positive. But honestly, I do think that the midterm elections will just be a small blip in what we see in markets. Unfortunately, everyone's kind of probably sick and tired of hearing this, but it's all about inflation. What's the, uh, the longer-term consequence of the fiscal response probably not being there regardless of who gets elected into the White House, even in 2024? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's interesting because we don't talk a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act as well, right, and the investment implications of the IRA. We've been looking a lot and doing a lot of research to see what are the different areas that we can actually invest in that are going to get tailwinds from some of that IRA money. And there are places and there's pockets of opportunity there. You manage cautious money, conservative money. If there is a new risk-free rate, I mentioned the two-year yield where it is, how does that change? And I don't mean this on a, on a, on a direct pension basis, but how does it change the actuarial or return assumption of international money? No, it's part of the building blocks of your capital market return assumptions, right? And we manage money for endowments, foundations, pensions. They want to have their money there in perpetuity. And so having, um, you know, these type of rates in the fixed income market, we are talking so much more about how to manage our fixed income exposure. Right. One of the best trades now is putting your cash in six-month T-bills. How do you manage your fixed income losses of the last couple of years? Everybody's enjoyed that. Yeah, you know, I mean, 16, what, the U.S. bond market is down about 16% this year, right? Equity markets are down about 25%. Uh, we've had a very diversified fixed income exposure. We've also included tips, gold, floating rate funds. There are a lot of pockets. We've stayed away from high yield. So we've been very short duration as well, which has actually helped us manage our and limit our losses on the downside. One thing we've been trying to work out is whether we operate with the underlying assumption that we're going to have Fed funds at, say, 3.5 to 5% for the next couple of years. Is that your basic assumption now? It is our basic assumption right now, but we are looking very closely, right, and when the Fed's going to pause, when they're going to pivot, and that's going to completely change some of the rotation in terms of portfolios and where you want to be putting your money. You might want to be increasing your duration. You might want to be increasing your fixed, in fixed income exposure. You're going to want to see where equities are in terms of valuations across the globe. When do you think you'll see a 60-40 kind of portfolio start to reassert itself in a positive way? 
I, I think, you know, I mean, timeline, I, I think you're out at least 12, 18 months before you start to see any sort of appreciation in the in the 60, 40 um, type of portfolio. And, and we're looking for just a diversified portfolio, a lot of alternatives today as well. Where does the diversification come from then? If we're basically faced with a positive equity bond correlation for the foreseeable future, you talked about diversifying. Where does it come from? So we have the advantage of being able to invest in private markets, right? And as much as we've seen valuations come down in private markets as well, they haven't come down as much in public markets. And there are so so much innovation going on, and there are lots of sectors that are actually less cyclical, I mean, or less economically sensitive and less cyclical than what we're seeing in tech today. So we're investing in food, we're investing in ag, we're investing in climate-related areas, all things that we think are going to be 10-year fold investments. Have private markets adjusted yet? When well, you look at them, have they really adjusted yet? Well, private markets never adjust. That's the beauty of private markets, well, right? Okay, but just because <laughs> something doesn't trade doesn't mean that it doesn't go down in value. Do you think that anyone's going to have to sell and lock in Someone's the declines that people are... Yeah, that's the point. So if you look at the venture side of things, right, if you look at some of the companies that are most well-run, they have 24, 18 to 24 months of runway in terms of cash. That's not that. That could get you through a period where you don't have to go to market very soon. So there's going to be a bifurcation in terms of companies that have been able to manage their balance sheets well and those that haven't even in the private markets. Alifia, good to see you, Thank as you. always. Alifia Dorawala there of Rock Creek Group. Did you call her a Batway Insider? I'm not, sure. Batway Insider. I'm not sure that Alifia oh, wants to be called a Batway. Sure. First, the first, thing, the first thing she said was, no, finance, what's a, what's internal finance. Rate to return we wake up doing? early. Hey, what's a new internal rate of return? <laughs> I mean, 5%. I, 5%? 1%? I don't know. We're not super optimistic on the market. That would be my question to David Rubenstein when he's on. Well, looking forward to that That's conversation. Is you should ask him about private markets is. and why they never market. We'll do that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Don't, don't get up. We're still yes. on air. Don't get up. Yeah. 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 I think she's going to wait to ask Rubenstein about <laughs> private <laughs> markets. You tell him. What are you selling? That was very Bravo-esque, wasn't what, yeah. it? You, know, you, you ask him <laughs> All right, I'm why out. they're not. You should ask him <laughs> that. Okay. I look yeah. forward to that. Coming up shortly, Congressman Peter Welch, Democrat from Vermont. Looking forward to that conversation. Thomas, we count down everybody to the final day of voting. We always call it election day, but it's been like election month, hasn't it? Hasn't it been it like weeks and, of this? To the point of 730 days to the next election. Election life. <laughs> election life. I like election that. Election life. Steal that. <laughs> Very good. Lisa, Lisa I like that. <clears throat> Futures up a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. For our audience worldwide, heard on radio, seen on TV, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Millions of Americans are delivering their verdict today. They'll decide whether Democrats or Republicans have the right ideas to guide the U.S. through inflation, a possible recession, and splits on cultural and social issues. If Republicans regain control of Congress, or even just one of the two chambers, President Biden's agenda would grind to a halt. Donald Trump has all but confirmed his widely anticipated third run for the White House. He told a rally in Ohio he would be making a, quote, very big announcement next Tuesday at his estate in Florida. The former president is hoping to take advantage of good election results for Republicans. The prime minister of Greece says his country is becoming a hub for importing green power to Europe. Kyriakos Mitsotakis spoke to Bloomberg at the climate change summit in Egypt. Have made that is not going to change. What will change uh, is diversity of supply when it comes to natural gas. We know we will need natural gas for the foreseeable um, uh, future. Greece is becoming an uh, energy hub to bring in uh, liquefied natural gas, not just to cover our country's needs, but also to provide natural gas for the Balkans, for Central Europe. Why not for yes. uh, Ukraine? Mitsotaki says Greece is working with Egypt on plans to build renewable power infrastructure and connections with Africa. And sales of Ferraris, Lamborghinis, and other supercars are booming in Japan. New registrations of cars costing more than $136,000 soared 64% in the first nine months of the year. Sales are fueled by post-COVID lockdown demand from wealthy buyers who also see the cars as good investments. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
We've seen the uh, House flip before in the last decade. House Republicans are ready uh, to lead on trying to control inflation, go back to pre-pandemic spending priorities, lead on unleashing American energy, and focusing on security. Congressman French Hill, the Republican from Arkansas in the previous hour here on Bloomberg Surveillance, live from Washington, D.C. On election day, here's the price action on the S&P 500, about an hour and 12 minutes away from the opening ballot, but he's positive two-tenths of one percent. Yields going absolutely nowhere. Let's call it down two basis points, which I guess is somewhere. 419.07 on a 10-year. <coughs> euro dollar 99.94. We're negative a quarter of 1%. Just a little bit of euro weakness and some dollar strength making a comeback after a few days of dollar weakness. Crude, 91.39, Tom. We're negative four-tenths of 1% there. On election day, John, and this has come up, I think Lisa's been great about this, talking about duration, this idea of time on the x-axis. And, John, I think it's where you can link politicians in election day into what we do in economics, finance, investment, which is the duration of these trends. The politicians have to be asking, as a core idea, how long does it take to get inflation solved? The persistence of the Federal Reserve, even if they do, ultimately stop hiking interest rates, and that's the conversation of last week. What did Chairman Powell essentially tell us? He said, slower but higher. And they've been telling us not just slower but higher, but also longer. So you've got slower but higher, right. but also longer. That's what the Fed's trying to signal. And Lisa, the partition here for so many politicians is fuel costs, gallon of gas and all that. We know the drill. But also rents as well. And do you, do you bundle them in? Do you, do you manage them in a way away from disinflationary trends we may see that Washington doesn't care about? Well, the problem is, what can any of these politicians really do single-handedly to offset a lot of these infla yeah. inflationary issues? So you're going to hear people come on and talk about different things, whether it's increasing <clears throat> production from the fossil fuels, whether it's trade agreements, and none of them are single-handedly going to bring down inflation because it is multifaceted. Well, and so ultimately, you have to say, where are the investments going? Where is the money on Wall Street going? And then <clears throat> also, what's the supply chain issue? What's the global issue that we're seeing and how quickly it gets resolved? First Tuesday of November, actually second who's counting Wednesday and then John Thursday inflation. Is this an inflation report that can truly change the Fed dialogue? I don't buy that. You'd have to have a massive downside surprise. What yeah. are we looking for? Something just I inside agree. 8%, 7.9? You'd it. have to have a massive downside surprise yeah. to change the dialogue into December. No. And by the way, I think we have two more prints before the December Federal Reserve meeting, so not just the one. To all of you on radio and television, it is our election coverage. We'll be here tomorrow morning. David Weston leading our coverage this evening. But we do touch on economics and certainly on the barometer of investment in finance, which is fixed income. Kelsey Barrow joins now fixed income portfolio manager that barely describes the intelligence of her nose at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Kelsey, I love, love, love the note gaming out the duration that we're going to see. If we get to some form of J. Powell terminal rate, what is the length that we will be there for? So historically, when the Fed reaches the terminal rate, they keep the policy rate at that level for about 7 to 12 months. And I think that it's reasonable to accept, expect a similar duration this time around. So we expect the Fed to get to at least four and three quarters, if not five, and then to hold it there. And the reason that they need to hold it there is that they need to see inflation come down so they get a significantly positive real Fed funds rate, because that's what our historical analysis shows us. It shows us that the Fed does not stop hiking until the real Fed funds rate, which is the Fed funds rate minus current inflation, is positive. So what does that mean for investing in riskier assets, Kelsey? I mean, a lot of people have been talking about uh, how this is going to kill a lot of momentum further in equities, but also in credit. And we're looking right now at high yield that has rallied sharply. Double Line came out and said that, uh, that they're actually seeing a real negative uh, tilt to high yield. They're not going to touch high yield right now. Would you agree with that, that this is sort of a no-go because it has not appreciated the risks out there? So if you look at the returns in high yield so far this year, the majority of the negative returns are being driven by higher risk-free rates, not by wider spreads. So I would agree we are uh, maintaining a very cautious stance to high yield. And the other thing that I note that you know we're not really focused on today, we're thinking about the midterms, we're thinking about inflation, 
But in the background, you have quantitative tightening, which is really just starting to ramp up. So I was looking back at this blog that I had written at the beginning of the year with, with a colleague, and at the time, the balance sheet was $8.7 trillion. It's just now getting back to $8.7 trillion. So we've only just round-tripped the expansion at the beginning of this year. And so we still have a lot more to go in terms of quantitative tightening. And I think that's really another reason to just stay cautious as it relates to the lower quality uh, area within fixed income. How much will any sell-off be accelerated by private markets that have not reset yet in terms of how much they're going to go down? You're hearing about fund managers saying, you promised us money, give it to us, and then people having to sell in order to give the capital. How much is that going to really accelerate the downturn in public markets that can be sold to raise capital for the private obligations? So liquidity management is extremely important, and I, I think this is something we've been thinking about. Uh, we know that the high yield market is higher quality than it's been in the past, but those lower quality uh, deals are going to the private market. And unfortunately, what, what may happen is the private market, because it's so illiquid, when people do need to raise the money, it's going to come from the public markets. And so even though the credit quality is higher than it is on average, you do need to think about that liquidity component. So for us, where we're really hiding out is still in the short maturity investment grade and securitized cash flows. When you can get six to 7% yield, break evens around 200 to 300 basis points, that is very attractive because we cannot lose sight of the fact that yields are materially higher. There is income and fixed income today. And where we need to start thinking about is where to be extending duration um, and adding to those core fixed income holdings. Kelsey, you've been awesome recently, and it's great to hear from you. Kelsey Barrow, though, of JP Morgan Asset Management. Kelsey, thank you, as always. Kelsey, alongside Bob Michael at JP Morgan, Lisa, just a reluctance to engage risk and credit right now. They just do not believe we've seen the wides in this credit market, given what they think is still to come in this economy. The interesting thing is other people disagree, and you're seeing high yield do really well, and you've seen a pretty significant rally over the past week or so in tandem with stocks. So who's on the other side of that? Tom? I would suggest their caution has been dead on. It's been a lot unspoken. They've just absolutely nailed the full faith in credit. You've talked about the losses in, in fixed income. Oh, I, don't get me going. You know how I feel about this. Forget about all the spread analysis. Price down, yield Hard. up. Hard. That's it. Hard. That's my sophistication. From Washington, this is Bloomberg. Two-day winning streak on the S&P 500 into Tuesday. Gains on Friday, gains on Monday. Gains this morning as well. Can we make it three? Equity futures up two-tenths of one percent on the S&P. Over the previous two days, the S&P up by 2.34 percent. Yields are lower by a couple of basis points on a 10-year 419.28. Crude is softer, lower negative, down a third of one percent at 91.50. And euro dollar, we've had some dollar weakness recently. Now a little bit of dollar strength against the euro. Euro dollar 99.97. TK on that currency pair, negative two-tenths of one percent. Interesting to see. I'm going to call it a quiet market here. And, John, you, you and I are talking about this, and it is about the election. It's not just about mystery to the inflation report on Thursday. It's just like, let's see where we are tomorrow morning. And see if we have to wait another four weeks for the outcome of yeah. Georgia and ultimately for the outcome to understand whether we have gridlock or not. There it is on economics, finance, and investment. Of course, here in Washington for two days, we are looking at elections. As we spoke to French Hill of Arkansas earlier we go to the other side and arguably the most interesting Democrat Party experiment in America, and that is Vermont. I spoke with Senator Leahy a number of weeks ago, his wonderful new book out, The Path of Senator Leahy Over the Decades, and it's been a path shared by his colleague Peter Welch as well, congressman, and of course in a dash for the Senate here on this Tuesday. Uh, so let me start with a Vermont tradition, uh, Congressman. Will you vote early? Will you vote often? 
Well, I'll vote early, but to vote often is a, is a Chicago tradition. So okay. just once and done. We'll, here. We'll, leave, we'll leave that to Mayor Daly and the rest. I need to talk about the transformation of Vermont and what is unspoken. I remember White River Junction years and years ago impoverished up the Connecticut River, and it is now bustling. It is a boom economy with an unemployment rate, I believe, under 2%. What is the Vermont pixie dust that makes for prosperity? Well, uh, White River is where I first came, 1974, and it was the town you described, and now it's doing extremely well. But, you know, I think there's a real civic tradition here where our businesses uh, and our government have worked very well together in partnership. And we've had a commitment to uh, our environment through Republican and Democratic governors. We've had a, a commitment to, in tough times, uh, trying to support people who needed help. Uh, and then lower taxes when, when times were good. So there's, I think, been a mm -hmm. very functional government here uh, through Republican and Democratic administrations where there's been uh, social liberalism and economic stewardship. Uh, and we pay our bills here in Vermont. As time moves on, as Senator Sanders retires, Senator Leahy retires, do you su suggest a Democratic Party that will move to a national center away from a more East Coast and West Coast liberality? Well, you know, let's define that liberality. I think what has worked for us and I think is good for the National Democratic Party uh, is to have uh, a commitment to the environment and understanding that there's got to be partnerships between uh, government and the private sector in order to get things done. And frankly, I think that's what you see with the Inflation Reduction Act on climate change, where there's a lot of tax incentives that's going to help create a market dynamic. Uh, and there's a, there's a good deal of civic cooperation here in Vermont, where people here listen more than they talk, where when we disagree with somebody, we don't assume bad motives. I mean, I, I actually think Oh, the way we do things here in Vermont, we've got a Republican governor, and we've got a Democratic plus uh, independent, of course, in Bernie Sanders uh, in the in Congress. But where uh, that mutual respect is something that we need, uh, and we certainly don't have election deniers here in the state of Vermont. But, Congressman, talking about the green transition, there's been so much pushback of late because of the need to invest <clears throat> in fossil fuels in the near term. How do you dovetail a message that is supportive for the oil and gas that people rely on to heat their homes in a winter uh, that's going to potentially be fraught with very high prices uh, with the idea that you need to invest long term with the idea that people don't want to spend too much money in the face of inflation? Well, no, you're exactly right. I mean, the bottom line here is if we're going to get to clean energy, and I think everybody knows we need to do that, it's got to be affordable. Uh, you know, if a person is going to want to get a truck and they want an F-150 electric, that ultimately has to be an affordable uh, purchase for them. And that's the, in order for that to happen, and this has been the case in many other technological transformations, government policy plays a big role with tax incentives that then encourage private investment. We saw that with solar, the cost of panels coming way down, but that we are not yet there in some of these other areas like the electric vehicles. Uh, in, so I think the combination of public policy and incentives to make that gradual transition. But in the meantime, you know, if people are going to get through the winter, we got to make sure that they have affordable heating fuel. And that'll be a big issue for us, uh, I think, when we return to Washington. Congressman, are you worried about the perception of the Democratic Party as have, having gotten too extreme on the left side? Well, certainly in the campaign, you know, the campaign reduces things down to kind of an absurd, uh, narrow definition. Uh, and in fact, when you look at our record, there has been significant focus on uh, economic uh, development and jobs. And, uh, you know, the big challenge we're facing right now is coming out of COVID. We've got inflation in this country, but we've got inflation around the world that's even worse than ours. And we've got to take the steps to bring it down. And the choice that we have here, this is what uh, is going to await us tomorrow after we get the verdict of the voters. We've got history with this Republican Party, particularly in the House, 
where they're pretty extreme policies. And we'll be hearing a lot of talk about getting government spending under control by reducing Social Security. We'll have a lot of discussion about getting a government spending under control by defaulting on our debt. We've been through that. And uh, colleagues of mine in the House are saying that they want to default on the de debt unless they get their way on their spending proposals. So there's a lot of jeopardy here, uh, depending on what the outcome of this election is, where we start going uh, in the House back to the impeachments, impeachment of Hunter Biden, maybe the impeachment of Joe Biden, default on the debt is a threat, government shutdown, and all of that's chaos uh, for the well-being of our uh, of our economy. Hey, Congressman, thanks for being with us today. Peter Welsh there, Thank the you. Congressman. On Election Day in America, Anne-Marie joining us around the table for some final thoughts on Election Day. AMH, <laughs> there seems to be a gap between the world that the Democrats see and the way that Americans feel about it, mm. whether it's the economy or whether it's crime in places like New York, how can they narrow that gap? Well, it's, I'm not sure if it's so much how they see it that's differently, it's how they communicate it that has really been the challenge. They have not been able to land their inflation message with the American electorate. And what you've seen is them throw a lot of options at the wall and not really anything has stuck. When it comes to crime, and I think of Kathy Hochul talking about the fact that they've put more money into it, but Americans, especially New Yorkers on the subway, MTA saying crime is up 30 percent, they're not feeling it. So what they've tried to do <clears throat> is just really hone in on these messages in the final days. And maybe that's helped because we have seen over the last weekend polls start to neutralize the ABC Washington Post poll, the NBC poll. Usually, usually. Massive neutralization in terms of what we saw early in the fall when their abortion, mm -hmm. uh, really, that, that rhetoric started to fall off and that wasn't resonating as much because people were really starting to grapple with these price pressures. Emory, I want to get out in front of Daniel Jurgen, who we're going to have on here. What an honor to, to close this hour uh, in this election day with Dr. Jurgen. Can't believe you're and saying my classic, name in the same sentence as his. It's a classic <laughs> book, The Commanding Heights, which is a book of optimism about the American domestic and international experience. Take the temperature of Washington's commanding heights on this election day. Is it there or is it just all cynicism and gloom to go the other way? You know, the President of the United States said yesterday he acknowledged coming off of Marine One after this rally in Maryland, he acknowledged the fact that they are likely going to lose seats in the House and that's going to be harder. But he said, but at the end of the day, I'm optimistic. I think it really depends who you ask. The Republicans are incredibly optimistic that they're going to maintain control or gain control um, following this midterm election. And then that's domestically. And then you, you mentioned Dan Jurgen, so my mind just immediately goes to internationally. There's a lot of questions about what does 2024 mean for international partners and depending on who gets that high seat in the White House. And Ray, what are you looking for to determine the leadership of the, the Democratic Party, really? Because there are some questions about whether President Biden will or can run again uh, based on his popularity. I think the first hints are going to be these midterm elections. How much is this a rebuke against the against uh, a referendum against President Biden? If he loses the House, he can probably swing swing a reelection. If he loses the Senate as well, those whispers amongst Democratic circles that potentially he should not be the leader for the next generation as he's going to be turning 80 years old at the end of this month, same you hear this in Republican circles about the former President Donald Trump as well in his late 70s, maybe those whisper, whispers start to become louder. TK's got one question. Where are we hosting breakfast this morning? Got there, right. <laughs> where's, where's, that, where's, where's the house? I thought you liked Ben's lunch? chili bowl. I made a reservation we, there. We, that one, <laughs> they don't take we get up so early, so it's really breakfast. lunch for us, yeah, so it's perfect. Okay. Hey, mate, it's good to see you. It's just nice, isn't it? You guys should come I back more said, often. I, I have talked to my people to realize Your that people, we have should, they spoken we to should, mine? I don't think that, no, okay. they don't speak. Okay, they don't speak at all. But I, I think that, that the Washington story, seriously, John, the Washington story for Global Wall Street and the people looking at economics, finance, and investment is tangible and just with what we've seen from former President Trump in the last 72 hours. John. The next election, it's on right now. Well, you've asked the interesting question, I think perhaps the question. If we get the results from the midterms, are we going to find out who the two people racing against each other are almost immediately because you're not going to see people run against them at primaries? I don't, yeah. Well, I want to know about the midterms in terms of 
do those whispers become louder against uh, the president? The but it's a no. big field. It's two years, guys. It is two years. You say years. it's a big field. That's, Hashtag not, election that's life. not my question. If the former president runs, <clears throat> does someone challenge him? I think Biden has to come out and he has to say, I was the only I one in this party to beat him. I don't mean Democrats. Oh. Does well, Ron Mike DeSantis Pence take is... a back seat? Do others take a back seat? Do they allow him to go at it? I don't think Ron DeSantis takes a back seat. No, Interesting. That. That's like the real Emory there. You know, the fired folks up. just fired up. AMH. Like really Long Island Emory. <laughs> yeah, but we don't need it to go that, you know, anyway. We've seen enough of that recently. Coming up, Dan Jurgen, Vice Chairman of S&P Global and author of the new map, Energy, Climate and the Clash of Nations. You should see AMH at a basketball, honestly. <laughs> Just like, as a fan. Uh, she went to a basketball game? Knicks on Saturday night. The Knicks? The Knicks. <laughs> the Knicks. <laughs> okay, cool. Against the Celtics. <laughs> it's a great game. <laughs> From DC, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Donald Trump says he wants nothing to distract from the importance of today's midterm elections, so he's holding off until next week before making what he calls a very big announcement. The former president is expected to declare he'll make a third bid for the White House. The U.S. votes today in elections that will decide which party controls Congress. Millions cast their ballots in advance. Republicans feel good about their chances to capture both chambers. President Biden admits it will be tougher for Democrats to retain the House than the Senate. Close races mean it could be just days before the final result is determined. Job cuts in the tech industry are now nearing levels last seen in the early stages of the COVID pandemic. In recent weeks, a number of tech companies have said they will put hiring on hold or cut jobs outright, such as Twitter, Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet. The Wall Street Journal says Facebook parent Meta is set to cut thousands of workers this week. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We haven't seen the impact of inflation and recession on consumer demand for hydrocarbon products. And we're already in a tight supply situation that you and I and others have talked about probably ad nauseum. So if China comes back, I think that's where, as, you, as a previous CEO said, that's where you get into the triple digits for WTI and Brent. Back in the 90s, that's Regina Mayer, the global head of clients and markets at KPMG, crewed back in the 90s right now. From New York City and from Washington for our audience worldwide, let's get straight to the price action. I was close, wasn't I? Yeah, I know. I, I know. Good. I know. I, I tried to saw you cost yourself. That was good. I know. I said it all this morning from Washington, from Washington. Anyway, futures up by a third of 1% You're on the S&P. Good afternoon. <laughs> if you're right, in London. Anyway, <laughs> still not afternoon. Now, no, it is now. Good morning. Futures positive. Yields lower by three basis Tell points. for 18.43. I'm joking. Euro dollar just in and around parity. Sub two tenths of 1%. We're negative a little bit on the euro and Tom, 91.15 on crude again. And we're facing down, facing down the real prob probability, possibility of getting back to triple digit crude. A dash to 100, we're not there yet. Close in the last couple of days, John. And, and I really think we've got to look at what all are saying, which is demand picks up, China comes back, and there we are, back above 100. If China reopens and the rumor mill, right. I have to say, it's been in overdrive, yeah. in overdrive over the last week or so on that topic. On election day, on hydrocarbons, and on election day on this nation, Daniel Jurgen joins us now to say he's vice chairman of S&P Global. Yes, author of a new map as the two parties will look for a new map into 2024. We could also say there's a class of nations. We could say that they both look for the prize today, but more than anything, they consider and we consider the commanding heights of 2022. Dan Jurgen joins us this morning. Commanding heights, it is the most optimistic modern treatment of capitalism that is out there. Has the optimism evaporated? When you look at the commanding heights of America, have we given up the optimism? Well, of I our think parents? certainly we can put it, to Tom, in terms of the balance of confidence in markets, which was very strong, has receded and it has shifted. And we've seen, you know, in, in terms of the last four years, or really since the financial crisis of 2008, kind of a reassertion of a stronger government role across the economy. It, uh, Lisa and John, I want to jump in here with a lot of other questions in a two hour conversation with you. I'm kidding, folks. We get Dan Jurgen for some precious minutes. Are we a two party nation? 
or are we fracturing our historic two-party system? Well, I think it's hard to see us not having a two-party system, but we probably at this point have a four-party system, the moderates and the Democrats, moderates and the Republicans, and then the two sides of the party. We need to talk about how we're going to build out refining capacity in this country. I've heard from Republicans that they're <coughs> pro-fossil fuels and they're hopeful that they can change the story. I think a lot of us have our doubts about that. You know better than most, in fact, better than pretty much everyone we speak to, that these individuals, these companies, make multi-decade decisions, and no one's willing to make that decision right now. Can we change that story in no, America? I, I don't think so. I think you'll see some modest, uh, you'll see a uh, bottlenecking of refineries and some expansions and some building, but basically uh, nobody's going to commit, as you say, to a long-term investment because you don't know what the regulations will be in three and four years. And in recent years, the regulations have really encouraged people to shut down refineries. So how has this really changed the political lines, the fault lines around the world? We, thought, we talk about how India has refined a lot of oil from Russia and then imported it or exported it, excuse me, back to uh, Europe. How much is the U.S., is Europe willing to crack down on those types of partnerships that are getting closer at a time when they need the ultimate product? I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, India was importing less, about 1% of its oil from Russia a year ago. Now it's 23%. And the Indian foreign minister just a day or so ago in, in Moscow said that uh, uh, Russia is, what do you say, a steady and time-tested partner. And, of course, uh, they're indicating they're not going to go along <laughs> with a price cap, although Janet Yellen is, uh, is going to New Delhi to encourage them to do that. But the Indians, I mean, this is a pretty strong assertion of their long-term relationship with Russia. You know, Liam Denning, a columnist uh, on Bloomberg Opinion, wrote a story about how $5 gasoline is a big problem for the Democrats, but it's not a big problem for, uh, for drivers. Are politicians trying to adopt the case for oil and fossil fuels and policy when really they've got very little control over it at this point? Well, I think that's true. I mean, even you talk about uh, windfall profits. I mean, the companies, I mean, it's really a global market. It's a very big global market with 100 million barrels a day. Uh, but nevertheless, we do know that gasoline prices have an outsized symbolic impact uh, as well as a real impact in terms of how people vote. When was the last time you saw relations between Riyadh and Washington as bad as they are right now? Well, I just came back from there, uh, and I would say it's pretty tense. I think it's been, you'd have to go back a few years. There have been earlier periods, obviously, Khashoggi was one period. But uh, right now, it was, you know, it was just, you could feel the palpable tension between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, although on a strategic interest, they, they do coincide. Do you think they can reconcile their differences? And if they don't at this point, if, as things stand, what are the consequences? Well, I think that the, uh, that's a very good question. I think ultimately this, uh, and I, I got into dialogues about that actually in, uh, in there. I think that ultimately the strategic interests will coincide, but it's, it's, a, it's a rocky period right now. And obviously uh, the cut in production uh, a month before the U.S. election uh, was very incendiary. I think the temperature has to be brought down because there are a lot of other big issues there, including Iran. There is a new map, Dan. But what the new map is, is about the tradition, the tradition, the fear of America that's seen in isolationism. What's our isolationism look right now with Ukraine and, frankly, with the tensions John mentions well, in Saudi Arabia? Well, I think Arabia? less so than it did a few years ago because we really revivified our basic coalitions with Europe and with our Asian partners. So I think that part, that part is different. But we are, you know, with this war is so uncertain and you could still have an accident that could carry it into a much more serious state. Dan, final question, and it's a tough one, so forgive me for asking it. This administration has found it very, very difficult to square this circle, to say, drill please, and auto to say, no more drilling. How do they square that circle? Well, I think you've just said it. It's, it's a very hard circle to square. It's a it's short term. We want more oil. Long term, we want to get off oil. And it's a very confusing message because, of course, if you're an investor, you're putting money in not for just tomorrow, but for the next few years. And so I think that, along with the, all the battles about ESG, is hindering investment. So U.S. production is up, but not as much this year as people would have expected. Lisa? I just think this is a fascinating issue, which just means higher prices longer term, right? I mean, then basically that's what this means. If you reduce uh, prices, if you reduce well, supplies, the only thing that you yeah. can end up doing is basically try to price it out of existence. Right. But that's not politically and, popular. And, and, and I think what you were talking about before, I mean, it's amazing to see that the oil price fluctuates on whether China is on the number of COVID cases in China, because you're missing maybe a million and a half barrels a day of demand from China. If you right. have that, we'd have a really tight market. Yeah, quickly here. Elephant and donkey in the room. 
Give us a one-year prediction on a gallon of gas Let's or on a price of oil. To, well, can we run out that? the clock here on that one? <laughs> <laughs> you punted. That was his punch. I'll Where's punt Brent crude going well, I think. Well, look, at, I think I, I was just looking at our economic forecast for 2023. If, if, if the global economy is weak next year, then that will put some... Uh, uh, price, but I think there's probably a floor around seventy or eighty dollars on a barrel of oil. Dan can see the clock counting up to fifty yeah. cents. Yeah. <laughs> He's just hoping that it gets there quicker. Was there. Uh, <laughs> Look at the time. Hey Dan, fantastic to see you. Good Thank to see you. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Dan Yergin, the wonderful Dan Yergin of S and P Global, and of course of so much more. Coming up, we'll count you down to the opening bow with Priya Misra of TD Securities, Mike Dada of MKM Holdings, Clinton Warren of JP Morgan Private Bank, and Henrietta Trays of Vader Partners. And I'm told AMH is making an appearance too. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>